Well, welcome to another premiere, and this is a special one uh, because very seldom do you see light industrial or commercial style machines on this channel, occasionally. And this particular one is a Singer 9560 from 1935, specifically born on September 17th, 1935. So soon, another birthday. That'll be cool, huh? And this particular machine came from a group size of about 3,000 machines, which was pretty typical for commercial industrial size uh, singers that were coming out at that time. And this one belongs to Jade and Lynn. And uh, it's going to be doing all kinds of fun sewing from fur to leather to who knows. And I'm excited now to be able to get it to this point where I can actually present it to you and show you what this machine is capable of doing, at least powered by a Husqvarna 1.5 amp motor, which is how I have the machine set up right now. You can kind of see that in the shot. Uh, in lieu of a servo motor, which is how Jade is going to be powering this machine, I set it up with a contraption of a Husqvarna base with a lot of weights on the back of it to hold it in place. So hopefully this will work out during the course of this premiere. You got to do what you got to do, you know what I mean? And you'll also see a real pretty shine in this machine as well. A far cry from how it arrived uh, at the workshop. So anyway, let's just jump into some sewing with us and I'll show you what she can do. And if you follow me on Facebook, you saw me sew off these other two line, lines of stitches before the other belt broke um, that I had driving this machine. So let's give it a try again and see how we do on this second run during this live premiere. And you can't see it off camera, but I'm going to be balancing the material with my left hand and I'm going to be powering it with the Husqvarna foot controller with my right hand. Yeah, I am. Ha ha ha! Here we go! Woo! Yeah! Woo! That's a line of stitching right there. That is a line of stitching. Well, that definitely turned out a lot better than my mini clip with that other belt because with that mini clip that you may have seen on Facebook, I got to right about here and the belt broke being driven by that Husqvarna motor. Nothing wrong with the Husqvarna motor, uh, but that belt just said, ah, enough's enough, enough's enough, I'm not going to go anymore. But we'll kinda, I'll kind of push this along. You can see my threads here. That's the, the bottom row is the one we just sewed. So I'll kind of push it along and you can take a look at that stitching, which is absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot on. And I am, I am working with a replaced bobbin case on this 9560. Uh, the 9560 uh, is a high speed machine that was used quite a bit in the clothing industry. And it eats up bobbin cases pretty quick. And this bobbin case that was in this 9560 was the original bobbin case I'm quite sure but you can see on that bottom row right there let me get this straight again that bottom row is just presenting a beautiful stitch a beautiful stitch and um, most of the singers that you're accustomed to seeing on this channel will typically go with a stitch range of about uh, six stitches per inch all the way down to 30 stitches per inch uh, this model 9560 will go from about eight stitches per inch all the way down to close to 30 I would say about 28 is where it'll end up uh, 
hitting that low point as far as the number of stitches per inch. So let me turn it over as well and we'll look at that lock stitch. I'll start on this end so you can see my threads. I haven't clipped my threads yet. My threads are still attached. So we're going to be looking at that bottom row again. And this is our lock stitch. So our upper tension is going to be managing this output as we're buzzing down these two layers of protected full grain leather. Now, if you know anything about anything, protected full grain leather is a true test of the strength of this 9560. Now, it's not even close to the max what this machine can do, particularly when it's going to be powered by a servo motor that uh, Jade is going to use that's probably going to peak around 6 amps. Right now, I'm working with 1.5 amps. But the thing we look at on these premieres is not the max of what that machine can do. We look at a versatility of the machine, in other words, a wide field of materials that it can sew successfully, and the quality of the stitch. And as you can see in this shot right now, that lock stitch, and if I flip it over again, that top stitch, which is on the top row now, uh, are just absolutely spot on. Beautiful stitching, uh, the spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch, the glory of the stitch is absolutely, as my friends over in the UK say, absolutely bang on. It's bang on. It doesn't get any better than this, folks. And you can see, again, if I bring it across, we sewed a real nice run with this machine. I mean, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it's still going, it's going more. There it goes, we're reaching the end, finally. So uh, I really wanted to have some fun and uh, just show you this machine kind of buzzing down. And if I widen the shot a little bit again, I'll, I'll kind of walk you around this machine. Actually, I'll come off the tripod, let me do that. Let me come off the tripod and I'll put on a little bit of music while we're looking over the machine. The last one I just played is called Staccato. Staccato. And now I'm going to play something a little bit more easy going. It's called uh, Home. H-O-M-E. And I see I have my uh, air compressor on. Let me shut that off as well real quick before we have that kick in. And I know Dusty and I kind of get jazzed by it, but it also kind of unrattles us a little bit. And I'm doing a live premiere. I need to focus. You know what I mean? Here's Home. All right, let's just come off the tripod real quick and I'll kind of walk you around this machine that belongs to Jade and that Lynn and her hubby uh, brought to the workshop. And they're Wisconsin people, by the way. They are Wisconsin people. So kind of just looking at the machine, uh, this is going to be your stitch length control right now. And when it's all the way in the down position like this, you're gonna get the longest stitch that this machine is capable of doing. If you decide to push it up, I'll kind of reach up here and use my thumb. Decide to push it way up there, you're gonna be at the shortest stitch possibilities for this machine, which again is gonna be right around 28, 25 to 28. But we're gonna be sewing in this range for the bulk of our sew-offs today, if not all of them, uh, generating right around uh, eight stitches per inch. I'm going to check my belt tension real quick. Checking my belt alignment too so that I'm not riding cockeyed on it. So you can, you can kind of see my setup here. I've got one weight right here in front to kind of keep the base from moving forward. And then over here I've got about 30 pounds of weights holding down the other side of this Husqvarna base. This would normally be a base that mounts to say a class 21 style Husqvarna uh, with the motor on the rear of the machine. So I basically took the base off of a Husqvarna, set it on the workbench, and this is a 1.5 amp motor which should be more than enough to get us to the finish line of this premiere today. Now some of the unique things about this particular model 9560 is in this area right here, you can see between the balance wheel and the pillar, 
there's a little gap point right here and there's a specific oiling point which is what this is right here you basically depress I can show you with my dental tool it's probably a lot easier to do it that way you basically depress this little ball bearing it's got a little spring on the other side of it kind of push that down and then you add your lubricant your oil on an industrial machine probably about every 10 hours of sewing you'll want to put about three drops uh, in there three to five drops and then you just release this and it closes up again and there's several oiling points like that uh, there's also oiling points like this that are, that are just an open well that are going to lubricate the various uh, components on the main shaft including uh, the pitman arm so oiling a machine like this because it's designed to be high speed is absolutely critical especially this oiling point right here because housed in here are ball bearings which is very unique uh, to the class 95 uh, and the 9560 model that we're looking at here and um, we kind of move across the machine well we'll start over here because we can actually read the serial plate now which is kind of nice did a lot of cleanup on that got that looking good and ought to be in Hollywood again and of course our Singer medallion stitch length control again right there and threading the machine is not really too difficult. Let's kind of look at that a little bit. So we're coming off the spool of the thread on top. And I did add a felt to this. A lot of the folks that operate uh, light industrial machines like this, they, they'll just put it over the spool pen. But I think the felt gives a little bit even or uh, a more even flow of the thread. And we are using uh, a size 89 upholstery thread today on this uh, model 9560. So we come across the top, then we've got a thread point right here where we have to kind of snake it through. We go down, we go up in the middle, and then we go down again on the far left one. We then follow it down through the tensioner, and it goes without saying, whenever you're threading a machine, whether it's light industrial or otherwise, always make sure your take-up arm is at the highest position, and make sure that your presser foot lever is in the up position as well so that those discs are wide open and you can get that thread deep in between them so that you're having uh, proper upper tension management. And you can see this one is set up as well to be in a table where you can also control that presser foot lever with a release that's built into the table. That's what this bar is about right here. It's another way of manipulating that presser foot lever uh, typically with your knee. So once we come through this upper tension here, it's going to be similar to some of the other machines you've seen on this channel that are not light industrial machines. You kind of come around the tension discs. Again, pull that thread into those tension discs nice and deep. And then we bring the thread over the top of this take-up spring. And then we come underneath this thread guide. We come behind this thread guide right here. We then come up to the take-up arm and you're going to thread it right through the hole come all the way down through this thread guide that's on the faceplate area come down at the bottom of the faceplate there's another threading point right here and uh, then through this final thread point right there just above the needle you kind of see that and then you're going to be threading this machine from left to right and uh, in this machine right now is a size 18 needle which equates to a size 110 and it's uh, it's more of a generalist type needle it's not specifically designed for leather or woven materials it kinda just covers that field of sewing and when you insert that needle you gotta be real careful how you put that needle in because this is an open shaft it's not like the 301 where you can only put the needle in one way with this needle you gotta make sure that that long groove you'll clearly see it on the needle there's a long groove on the left side and that's the way that should be facing. I'll kind of come in on it. I don't know if we'll be able to see it or not. The camera will probably go out of focus if I get too close. But there's a long groove on this side and then down near the scarf on the right side you'll see that there's a bevel in on it with this design needle. You kind of can see it in, in that shot right there. See how it kind of bevels in? So long groove on the left, bevel on the right, the bevel facing the pillar basically as you're looking at the machine. 
and then again thread it from left to right and uh, I mean I think it's a fairly easy machine to operate it's just a matter of maintaining it because as you look around the machine a little bit you'll see oiling points everywhere again because this machine was designed primarily for clothing manufacturing and it was designed to be a high-speed uh, machine so there's lubrication points that are marked here down over here just to the right of the uh, the branding medallion and uh, certainly additional oiling points along the base of the machine on the bottom and certainly in the faceplate area as well and the faceplate is easy enough to take off there's one screw right here and then this this screw on top is typically just tight enough that it kind of holds the plate from being able to wiggle back and forth but you just pull it st off straight away and then look for any of those pivot points uh, again oiling about every about every 10 hours uh, two to three drops and again in this area over here where you've got that ball bearing pack you want to go probably about five drops of uh, oil so this is the 9560 and if you're not familiar with the class 95 model it came out right around 1911. 1911 was such a pivotal year for so many innovations across the U.S., including this Class 95. And uh, when you look at the Class 95, it's going to be a little bit shorter in overall length than the, the class that followed it, the Class 96. So they made this a little bit more of a compact model. As a matter of fact, my friend Dusty from Colorado saw this pop up on my Facebook page and he goes, I love that, it's so cute. It's like a tiny version of say a, a, a Singer 3115. And he's absolutely right. They made this to be more compact. They made it a little bit tighter uh, than certainly the 3115s. And they even made it uh, smaller and more compact than the, the class that followed it, uh, the class uh, 96 models. Now, within this class, I'll just share a little bit of history with you as we're looking at Jade's machine. The Class 95 had a slew of submodels in it, both in the U.S. and the U.K. It rolled out, first of all, with the 95K. Oftentimes, Singer would roll out models over in the U.K. first, and if they had success, then they would put them into the marketplace in the U.S. So we started with the 95K, right around 1911. We then moved to the 95-1, then the 95K1, then the 95-2, then the 95-10, then the 95-11, I gotta take a breath, then the 95-12, then the 95K32, then the 95K33, the 95-40, the 95K40, the 95K41, the 95-41, the 9542, another breath. <sighs> the 95K43, and last but not least, ta-da, the 9560. So there were a lot of Class 95s that preceded Jade's 9560. And I think they really perfected this Class 95 by the time they got around to the 9560 that belongs to Jade. Now, after this model came out, there were some models in the Class 95 that followed it. Uh, there was a 9580, there was a 9582, 9584, and finally the last model within this class was the 95-100. So, uh, and the way you can tell what you got if you've got a light industrial machine like this in the class 95 series is normally there should be a plate on the front of here which I spent a lot of time cleaning this up for Jade so that she would be able to have it as an additional badge mark to show off to folks. So if you can come out here and see if it stays in focus, maybe. So there you can see the badge mark, which is brass, and it showcases the fact that this is a 9560. And that's typically where Singer would put their light industrial model badges right above the Singer badge mark. So, a fabulous machine, and as you saw in the opening of this, still have the thread attached, lays down just a spot-on stitch. The one, again, with the tassels hanging down is the one that we just did on this live premiere. And again, this is two layers of uh, protected 
uh, full grain leather. Protected full grain leather is super duper slippery stuff. Very slippery stuff to work with. And also, because of the way it's processed, it has a much, much higher piercing threshold than, say, a standard uh, genuine cowhide. So with the ease of how this machine got through it, again, powered by, the Swedes are helping us out today, powered by a 1.5 amp Swedish motor, uh, it just got the job done beautifully. And th then again is our, our lock stitch that we're looking at right now on the rear of this sew-off. So I'm going to throw this to the side as a definite pass. You can kind of see the thickness of what we just went through there. And again, what Jade is going to be using is a servo motor set up in a table with this machine. Uh, if it can buzz through two layers of protected full grain leather like this, powered by a Swedish 1.5 amp motor, can you imagine what this machine is going to do being driven by probably a 6 to 8 amp uh, servo motor? It's going to be pretty nuts. Pretty nuts. But at any rate, I'm going to throw this huge sew off to the rear right over here. That'll be our sew off sandwich pile right there and i'll just show you real quick over here these are some of the sew offs that i did off camera uh this is a also a uh, a type of protected full grain leather it's dyed differently different die cast that they used on it different die color i should say not cast and here i was working on working with this new bobbin case that i put into the machine the old bobbin case is right back here in my magnetic tray if i kind of zoom in on it this is the original bobbin case that was in the machine, and I could tell that it was struggling. Bobbin cases on high-speed machines like light industrial machines, uh, they don't last forever. Uh, again, because of the revolutions of that raceway and the amount of wear that's put on these bobbin cases, uh, they have a shelf life usually under lighter use of around six months, somewhere in that range, and this one is well beyond its expiration. And then I found in my uh, personal collection of bobbin cases and bobbins, I found these extra bobbins that when uh, Jade and Lynn come back to the workshop to pick this up uh, in about a week or so, uh, I'll ask them, do you have extra bobbins? If not, I'll donate these to the cause because these bobbins are really kind of oddball shaped when it comes to uh, fitting them properly into uh, the bobbin cases that work in these class 95 machines so they may have more bobbins already and they just sent it with the one bobbin uh, or they might not have any and then at least they'll have three the one that's in the machine plus these two but at a glance when you look at them if you're familiar with uh, the the Foff machines that I've presented on this channel they look almost like a Foff bobbin but the Foff bobbin is going to be a little bit bigger in circumference and will not go into this bobbin uh, case so and that's the thing when you're dealing with bobbins and bobbin cases is, is they need to fit like a glove again that bobbin is going to be turning at a high revolution uh, it's going to be pulling that thread and distributing it from the bottom of the machine it's got to fit like a glove if there's extra wobble if there's extra movement uh, you're going to have issues with either breaking the thread jamming it or having other issues as far as how the machine is going to feed that thread so when I checked these to make sure that they were the proper fit, I used my mechanical caliper. And once I get the uh, camera back up on the tripod, I can try to do a measurement on these. So if you're struggling with, okay, what are the caliper measurements of the proper bobbin for the Class 95 uh, Singer uh, industri industrial light industrial machines, I can let you know that based on my mechanical caliper measurements. All right. So again, off camera, I was kind of goofing around. I wanted to get the uh, stitches right. So I was testing it on this type of uh, protected full grain leather. Was struggling a little bit getting the balance initially. Uh, this machine is a little bit more sensitive than some of the other light industrials that I've worked with. Um, in part because it uses more of a traditional non-numbered open face uh, singer uh, upper tension like you'll see on some of the household machines that I presented on this channel. It doesn't use a, a special designed upper tension. It's Singer pretty much went with the same thing that they were using on other machines that are not classified as industrial machines. So it took a little bit of balancing, but I tried to get it balanced so it'll work with heavier materials like this, and certainly like the blue one that we just did on camera. I'm gonna throw that back over here too. 
And then I was testing other leathers as well. Uh, this is two layers of another type of protect, protected full grain leather. Let me just double check. Yeah, this is also protected full grain. Protected full grain and, and Italian leather sometimes have very similar characteristics, so I have to sometimes give it a second look. But you can see two layers of this, and again, powered by a Husqvarna 1.5 amp motor. Right now, we're dealing with probably about, well, we, we probably have only about a quarter of the power that uh, that Jade will be working with, with this machine, with her servo motor. Probably about a quarter of the power. And it can do two layers of protective full grain leather, uh, just like a hiccup. Then I decided, you know what, I'm going all heavy duty and hardcore here. I also want to try it just on some cotton polyester blend with a stiffener in the middle. So then I was doing stitch offs on here as well, trying to get the stitching uh, balanced just perfectly with a much, much lighter material. This is a cotton polyester blend and a far cry from the, the leather stuff that I was sewing. So I just wanted to see how the machine would perform with a much lighter sew off as well. And it did very well. Now here we have a shorter piece of this protected full grain leather. Again, two layers, and again, just kind of getting the stitching balanced uh, well with the machine. Then I got some of my genuine elk hide, and I was kind of buzzing down uh, two layers of this as well, just seeing how the machine would be able to manage this chemically processed leather. I think I also did a couple of stitch rows on the elk hide that was way down there, like in the 20 stitches per inch range as well. But you can see the, the machine managed this elk hide beautifully as well. That is some definite page 34 stitching that I did off camera uh, with uh, Jade's 9560. And again, look at that elk hide from the side. You know what I mean? I mean, it's anything but lightweight. And elk hide, again, being chemically processed, it is a booger when it comes to trying to mess around with stitch quality. Here's even a thicker piece of the elk hide, uh, probably about four, four or five ounces of leather, I would suspect. And uh, when you look at the stitch quality as I was perfecting it, it's just absolutely spot on, absolutely spot on. So not only is this a strong machine, and it's going to be a machine on steroids when Jade sets it up in that table with that servo motor, uh, but it's also a very, very high quality stitching machine as well. It does an excellent job. Here's where I tried to bring that stitch length way down, which is kind of a little bit nuts because I'm dealing with a size 89 upholstery thread and I'm trying to lay down about 15 to 20 stitches per inch. There's not even room for the thread, folks. You can see down here, I really went, I really went crazy and tried to bring the stitch length way, way down to probably around 25 uh, stitches per inch. And you can see it's it's significantly impaired using a heavy thread like that. But it's kind of fun to try it, you know? And one little stubby piece that I was kind of just goofing around with, laying down a stitch row, probably around eight to nine uh, stitches per inch again. So so this was, give you an idea of how much I've worked this needle already. Again, it's a size 110 or a size 18 US needle. So it's a big needle. Uh, all of this was sewn, sewed this, all of this actually on this needle. All the two rows that were done in the, on that mini clip and then the row that we did just now. So uh, we're, we're going to be doing a little bit of needle abuse on uh, Jade's machine. And I did pick up additional needles. It does take a specialty style needle on this Class 95. So I wanted to make sure that uh, Jade had needles to start out with. Uh, brand new bobbin case in the machine. I also picked up a backup bobbin case for Jade as well uh, because, uh, again, because these are high-speed machines, this one designed with that bearing pack over here, they're designed to run. I mean, some of these machines can hit 3,000 stitches per minute. 3,000 stitches per minute. I mean, that's like... Brrm! I mean, it's like rapid fire. And uh, so they will burn out bobbin case uh bobbin cases pretty quick and so uh jade has a brand new bobbin case in the machine she's got her original one back there and then i have an additional bobbin case for her as well and i can always I, i'll be more than happy to work with uh, jade and lynn and as they need more bobbin cases which they will and they need more needles i can i can expedite getting those for them 
But isn't it just a gorgeous machine? And as you look at it, you can see, compared to a lot of industrial machines, how compact Singer made this Class 95-60. So it's got, it doesn't really have portability because it's, it's heavier than a, I mean, it's heavier than a whatever. I mean, it's heavier than a big car. You know what I mean? It's quite heavy. Uh, but, uh, but from a standpoint of other industrial machines, it almost has the look of uh, portability. So there you go. So a little bit of a history on Class 95. Uh, more details. Kind of showed you how to thread Jade's machine as well. Talked a little bit about needles. Talked a little bit about the other specifics of the machine. So with all of that blah, 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 now let's uh, go back on the tripod, put on a little bit more music, and we'll do some more sewing on this machine and see how uh, this 9560 does. I think it's going to do fabulous. Even with my uh, my power hack and using the Husqvarna uh, setup that I have right now, which seems to be working pretty well so far. All right, so let me pause it there for a second and plug the camera back in so we've got reliable power. There we go. And I'm just going to check my notes through real quick to see if there's anything else that I wanted to mention to you about this. I don't think there is. I think we pretty much covered all of that. Uh, and you got a good understanding of what kind of machine we're looking at here. And at least for today, let's just say that it's kind of a modified Swedish beauty because of the power source that we're using to drive it. So we listened to home. We listened to uh, Stiletto, I think was the other one we listened to. Now we're going to listen to something called Innocence, Innocence. <clears throat> so I think what I'll jump into now is I'll head back down to the needle and we'll do a super light sew off. Definitely light sew off for any Singer machine, but in particularly uh, in particular, a light industrial machine. And you'll notice right there, there's another one of those oiling points. You have to depress that spring uh, uh, cover there and then put your oil in there for the raceway and main shaft down near the end of the run. And this would be considered a high shank uh, machine uh, by the way the uh, presser foot attachment attaches to the machine and I didn't mention it but the uh, the screw that holds the uh, the needle in the needle bar had to be replaced as well someone had cracked the head off of it which wasn't going to work real well for being a resource to Jade uh, in doing her sewing and having to change out needles on a regular basis okay so we're, we're looking at a cotton blend with a stiffener let's buzz down this a little bit and see how this super muscular 9560 does showing on a super lightweight uh, material like this and I'll turn the music down again we're not listening for the motor because we're using a Swedish motor but you can at least hear the, the machine run and it runs beautifully alright so let's do this light so off we'll See if we can maybe go down and around on it. A little bit trickier with a light industrial machine, but I'll give it a go. And again, like any sewing machine, always start with that take-up arm at the highest position. You can have the best even launch when you do. All right, here we go. I have to kind of hand start it a little bit. <laughs> oh, going off course, Scott, going off course. Oh boy, you went way off course, buddy. Ugh. All right, we'll try that one again. I was going to go down and around. I don't know if I'm going to or not. This doesn't have what would be considered a walking foot, but uh, it's not as easy to maneuver a machine like this as a household style machine. It's a little bit trickier, a little bit trickier. 
So I'm gonna do this totally different than I normally do it. I did one stitch row down, and now I'm gonna buzz down and then I'll try to make my turn at the bottom. I'll see if I can do that more successfully this time than I did the first time. All right, take up arm all the way up. Let's try this again. Oh my goodness, I just totally gummed up that material. I just totally gummed that material up. All right, I'm gonna close the box just because it's fun to say that I closed the box using a light industrial machine. Here we go. All right, I sorta of closed it, sorta of, kinda. All right. And from the original bobbin cases, I'm just gonna to check to make sure I'm correct. Yeah, from the original bobbin cases, um, I'll show you an innovation that they came up with, which I thought was kind of cool. Give this thread a clip. Again, I'm using upholstery thread. So these clips are going, are you out of your mind? There we go. Well, my sewing path isn't very brag worthy, but it looks like I did a fairly decent job. Again, it's a little bit tougher to maneuver this stuff. So we're gonna look at the top stitch first. I'll kind of move it past uh, the camera as best as I'm able. I'll kind of tilt it back a little bit too because of that pucker of the material where the material puckered up. You can't really see the stitches kind of tucked underneath there. So I'll tilt it back a little bit so you can see those stitches more readily. But I can tell you this, those are some page 34 stitches, especially for a light industrial sewing, uh, super lightweight material like this, which normally they, I mean, they do clothing and stuff, but there's usually multiple layers. So I think it managed uh, this sew off very well, very, very well. And again, when you're working with a diverse field of materials, everything from a cotton blend like this with a little bit of stiffener all the way to heavy grade, multiple layers of leather. You might have to tweak that uh, upper tension just a little bit to get that sweet spot between the lock stitch and the top stitch, but I'm very pleased with this, very pleased. So I'm gonna rotate it to the camera and we'll take a look at that lock stitch now. I'll start all the way on the end and we'll bring it back and forth. You can look at that lock stitch. I'm kind of looking at my screen over my shoulder so I can kind of see it as you're seeing it. And again, I mean, we're dealing with upholstery thread. We're dealing with a size 110 needle, which equates to a U.S. size 18. And when you're talking about a needle of that size and thread of that weight, uh, sewing, you know, a material like this that doesn't have a lot of depth and thickness to it, uh, this 9560 managed that task I mean, brilliantly. It did a brilliant job, truly. Okay, I'm gonna make you dizzy if I keep going back and forth. So I'm gonna throw that to the back as a pass as well. I think uh, Jade's machine did very well with that. Uh, again, it's sometimes, and I, I think uh, a number of the folks that follow my work very closely, like Paula Noel and others, uh, are spot on, and I've said this as well, that a machine being able to sew heavy duty is one strength of the machine. The machine also being able to manage lighter weight materials uh, is another strength of the machine. They're equally important depending on the needs of the individual sewing. Again, for Jade's purpose, I think she's gonna be doing much heavier stuff. So it's not gonna be, she's not gonna be sewing a lot of light type stuff. She's not a quilter. That's not why she has a 9560. Uh, she's gonna be doing much heavier gauge type sewing. So we'll focus on that probably primarily uh, during this premiere. We'll focus a lot more. Again, I try to build the pr premiere so that it's relevant to the owner. Um, and sometimes I get bad feedback from some folks on why didn't you show this? Because it's not relevant to the owner. That's why. The owner is going to be doing this type of sewing. And so I wanted to really focus that machine on that type of sewing, if that makes sense. All right, how about a little bit more music? Let's see what we can put on here. We'll put on something, let's see here, I think we played that one. Why don't we play Pop and Gold, Pop and Gold.
Oh, and I also wanted to show you the difference between the bobbin cases. So again, this is the original bobbin case right here. I'll put it like this. That's the original bobbin case right in the shot. I'll come a little bit wider. That's the original bobbin case that was in this machine when uh, Jade, uh, actually when Lynn and her husband dropped it off. Now I'm gonna open a brand new bobbin case that I ordered for Jade. Kind of cut that open. We'll take it out and we'll look at the difference between this uh, aftermarket but to original specs bobbin case how it differs from the original one so the other than being more shiny duh <laughs> other than being more shiny the other difference you'll notice is on the inside so on the inside of this bobbin case the original one it's pretty much like any bobbin case you would have seen on this channel what they decided because again this is a high-speed machine that's why they have that ball bearing pack to the right of the pillar adjacent to the balance wheel they wanted to give this bobbin even more flexibility in spinning up fast kind of like the concept and it's kind of it's kind of relevant that we're using a a Swedish motor to power this industrial machine because remember the Swedish came up with something called a jam free raceway it was a hook system that would move front and back and up and down during the sewing process and that's kind of what they were thinking about when they upgraded from this original bobbin to this style of bobbin that has I'll do my best to balance this Ah. All right, I'm trying. So all the way in the back of the remake, you can see that there are some spring bands so that when you put a bobbin in there, it's you're actually going to be pushing against those springs uh, and it's going to allow that bobbin to move back and forth from front to back just slightly as opposed to the original that's going to be on your right, on your left, excuse me. The one that's going to be on your left that doesn't have those spring bands, so the the bobbin is going to be spinning basically within a limited space. It's not going to have the ability to flux a little bit. So I think that that's a great uh, improvement with the aftermarket one that's on the right uh, because it's going to allow you to operate the machine at even higher speeds without experiencing uh, issues with the thread feeding very rapidly as you're running at around you know maybe 1500 to 2000 stitches per minute I mean that's flying that's flying so uh, I just wanted to show that to you because I think it's kind of cool and uh, you know sometimes when they remake things they they make them exactly the same or sometimes they even make them worse off than the original uh, OEM style parts that you know would operate within that machine in this case I think they went the right direction and they actually made an improvement so that you can operate the machine at higher revolutions without having issues uh, with that uh, bobbin thread uh, being fed through the machine all right blah 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 so what are we going to sew next I think we might do some genuine cowhide let's see and we'll put on far farther ridden while we're doing this <coughs> Kind of a rock sound. It's kind of fun, isn't it? All right, let me change my camera angle. So you can kind of see in this shot right now why I call that a high shank. And a lot of light industrial machines are going to be high shank style. And you can see as well that on Jade's machine, look at the clearance between those feed dogs and the bottom of that presser foot. That is really cool. But again, what are you going to be sewing? You're sewing at a light industrial level, you need that clearance, right? Oh, I know what else I was going to do, and I totally forgot about it. 
I was going to give you the dimensions of the bobbin because like I said it's a tricky bobbin when it comes to the dimensions and it it kind of mirror matches uh, the Foff bobbins so this is uh, an original bobbin for what would work with this class 95 so let me see if I can do some caliper measurements for you real quick so if you're dealing with trying to find a replacement bobbin for your class 95 You'll have you'll be at least equipped with the uh, with the measurements. Okay, so first of all, the height of the bobbin. You're looking at. Uh, make sure I get this right. You're looking at nine nine point five millimeters. We'll just say nine. I just I just compress that caliper a little bit more and. It's closer to nine, so let's just say that the height of the bobbin from here to here is going to be nine millimeters. Now about the height of it, so we're going to be measuring it like this now. The height of it is going to be right around 21 millimeters. So from top to bottom, 21 millimeters, and uh, when we're looking at the depth of the bobbin, like this, we're looking at right around nine millimeters. Now the other, th other thing you'll run into is that center hole. The center hole will differ on a lot of bobbins that will be similar looking to this. So I'm gonna see if we can get a measurement on that hole as well, just so you'll, you'll be armed with that information. Okay, I think I got it. So that hole is going to be five, six, six millimeters across is that hole. So six millimeters here, nine millimeters here, and then the height again. Just want to make sure I got this right. 21 millimeters. So 21, nine, and six. Hopefully that's helpful to you if you're looking for a bobbin replacement. And again, you're going to have mounted to the table a special bobbin winding assembly that will be rotated into that treadle style belt, similar to a lot of treadle tables, uh, in order to wind a bobbin with this machine. I actually wound it with uh, a more contemporary bobbin winder, uh, and I was able to do it successfully, even using upholstery thread, which I thought was kind of cool. So that's also an option if you if you have a machine like this as a standalone and you don't have uh, a table set up with it, where you're going to be driving it, you know, through that table and using a bobbin winding assembly like on top of that industrial table, uh, you could always get an aftermarket bobbin winder and just wind your bobbins that way as well. It certainly does work because I did it three times. Yeah, I did. All right, just checking my belt tension again. So that was called Farther Ridden. Now we're going to call Frame Frame of Mind. Frame of Mind. Trying to turn down just a little bit. Okay, I think my camera shot is good. Yeah, that's good. I think that's a good shot right there. Coming just a hair. All right, let's do some genuine cowhide now. And again, with a machine like this that's designed for high speed, uh, you you may have to tweak uh, the upper tension a little bit depending on the type of material that you're sewing. Right now I have it set up pretty much for leather, so we should have some good success in sewing this next one that is a genuine cowhide. And I've got a fairly long run, not fairly long, I've got quite a long run on this as well. And I can see that I probably have this a lot wider than I need to have it. Let me just cut this in half real quick. Because again, I buy my leather as scraps from this company that makes these uh, seats for these private jets. But even at a scrap price, it's definitely not cheap. But I think it's kind of clever on their part to uh, make a profit from the scraps that they don't need. You know what I mean?
Okay, didn't cut that real well, but fairly well. Deciding which piece I want to use here. We'll use this wider one. Yeah. Okay, so again, genuine cowhide, you can kind of look at the nap of that side. But when I fold this, I'm going to face, face the finished sides out so we'll be able to see the stitches a little bit more easily. So let me fold it in half. I'll get it underneath the presser foot. And we will buzz down this. And hopefully I can sew fairly straight. But again, realize I'm managing the material with my left hand. And I'm controlling the foot controller up on the table with my right hand. Because with this setup, the cord on the Husqvarna foot controller isn't long enough to reach all the way to the bottom floor below the workbench area. So we're kind of we're kind of spitballing it here a little bit. And speaking of spitballing, I should ring the bell even bladedly to signify that class has started. <laughs> oh my goodness! I just had one extra set of hands, huh? All right, so let's give this a go. We're going through two layers of a genuine cowhide, probably about six ounces of leather, and uh, we'll see how uh, Jade's 9560 does with this task. It did fabulous with the protected full grain leather, but as you change the grades of leather, machines will sometimes perform even better, sometimes they'll struggle, so we'll see how this 9560 does with two layers of genuine cowhide. All right, you ready? All right, so I'm gonna give it a little hand start. We'll get this rolling and we'll uh, see what happens. Oh boy, I went way off course, way off course. Hold on a second. Yeah, that's that helped a little bit, but not much. Not much. <laughs> See if I can get past this little bump here. And yes, you can hand turn this too, even though it's a light industrial machine. Oh, good gravy. I'm gonna cheat and just raise my presser foot. We get back on course here. So we'll have a break of those uh, stitches. We'll have a break of those stitches, and that's okay. All right, here we go. But see, I have to take my hand off of the material again to hand start it because this uh, motor, let me see if I can do this. Ugh. Machine's doing great. I'm not doing so well in steering it with one hand here. All right, I'm going to stop there. I may have just jammed this when I was trying to go cockeyed like that. Oh, I see what happens. I wasn't looking up on top. My, uh, my thread on top of the machine, again, with upholstery thread, it's not going to stay true to that uh, spool as readily as you would want it to be, so it came unraveled a little bit. All right, I got that back in place. I'm going to clip my threads and just try to finish this stitch line. So Jade's machine is doing spectacular. I'm not doing such a great job in managing this uh, cowhide, that's for darn sure. So I'm going to try to do this last little stitch line. This is going to be one of the weirdest looking stitch offs that you've ever seen probably, but that's okay. Get my take up arm all the way up. We'll see if we can just stitch. We're going to basically just stitch a couple inches down because I want to at least try to finish the stitch line to some extent. Okay, that's where I'm stopping. I'm stopping right there. Oh, I gummed it up a little bit again. All right, let me give that a clip. Well, 
like I said, I like premieres to be a, a genuine challenge, and I definitely am having that today. <laughs> Threading a needle on camera. It's fun, isn't it? <laughs> Jeez. And you're probably looking on camera and go, a little bit to your left, Scott, a little bit to your right. A little bit to your left, a little bit to your right. You folks have said you love to see me struggling, so you're getting your money's worth today. Oh, that is one wonky sew-off right there. That is one wonky donkey sew-off. All right, well, we're not going to worry about that. I'm not making a product to sell. I'm showing what this product can do with managing cowhide. And I can tell you already from my seat right here it did a spectacular job spectacular job much better than I did keeping on path that's for sure yeah top end lock stitch is looking really good okay a little bit more music on to calm my soul after battling this beast so that was called frame of mind and now this is a fun one to kind of unwind to it's called Downtown Metropolis Chase. You've heard this before. Kind of a James Bond style. So let's start all the way over here where I actually started straight, which was pretty cool. And you can see we've got some beautiful stitching on the part of this 9560. The stitch formation, the stitch integrity is just absolutely spot on. Even where I deviated right here trying to get back on path, uh, the stitching stayed very consistent. Very consistent stitching from this 9560. Try to come in a little bit closer. There we go. Here's where it all went down south. See all that leather I missed? And then we got back over here and we tried it on this side. Let me see if I can get back over there. And I finished off that last little line of stitching that I wanted to try to do. And during that entire hullabaloo, the machine maintained excellent stitch quality, ex excellent stitch formation, even with all of my wonky donkey stuff going on. Oops. Beautiful stitch quality. Look at that stitching. And that's indicative of how the machine sews right there. Page 34 stitching, which again, if you're brand new to the channel, page 34 means near perfect stitch. I never call something a perfect stitch because if you hit a perfect stitch, you're done. I mean, how can you improve on that? And again, the philosophy of my workshop is Kanai, constant and never ending improvement. We're going to be better tomorrow than we were yesterday but we're not going to be as good as we will be tomorrow. So we're always trying, I'm always trying to improve my processes, my methods, my restoration techniques, everything I do, I always want to make it better. And so I'm going to call that a page 34 near perfect stitch because it is just absolutely spot on. If I turn it over, we'll look at that lock stitch as well, which you're not going to see anything different. Even in spite of all of my blunders and trying to stay on course with this kind of kind of tricky uh, genuine cowhide uh, we laid down stitching that is absolutely as it should be and again as you're working with a diverse field of materials you might decide to change things up a little bit as far as adjusting uh, the upper tension because that machine will manage things well but it'll manage things even better sometimes with a slight tweak of that upper tension 
But even in spite of this tricky sew off, because uh, again, I'm sewing with one hand, I'm trying to hand start the machine because it's being power, powered with a real lengthy stretch belt over a Swedish uh, motor pulley. I mean, it, it's, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of doing the circus thing today, you know what I mean? Circus Olay. A little bit of Circus Olay thing going on today. But even in spite of all of that, Jade's machine managed the stitching part of it extremely well. Extremely well. All right, I'm going to throw this to the back and forget about it. <laughs> oh, that's one of the... Of course, I usually don't have to manage the machine this way, so I'm not going to fault myself too badly on that. And it's working so far, so we're just going to keep plugging forward. All right. So that was called Downtown Metropolis uh, Chase. And now we're going to do something called Hot Salsa. Hot Salsa. All right. Now I will do some genuine elk hide. And we'll see how uh, Jade's machine does in managing that. We'll do a single layer to start, and then I'll add a second layer to it. So single layer to start. All right, here we go. Single layer of genuine elk hide. I'm just going to jump into this. We'll move forward and forget about that last sew off forever. All right, here we go. Beautiful stitching. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you can see that in the camera. And you can also see the thickness of that oak hide as well right there this is a fun song isn't it i needed this song after that last so off yeah i did all right we're going to try to bump it up to two layers now which may be a little bit crazy considering how i'm managing the sewing process but we'll give it a try but first of all, I'll show you the stitching on this one. I might have to change my camera angle. Yep, I sure will. There we go. And look at the thickness of that material right there. Again, chemically processed elk hide, folks. It doesn't get any tougher than that. I'm going to stop right there. That is page 34, folks. Page 34. You can see the thickness right there. I mean, I'm not just doing, that's not just bravado. I mean, we are talking about a super thick material, plus it's chemically processed, which galvanizes that leather surface to make it more durable. Absolutely gorgeous. Let me flip it over and let's look at that lock stitch now. I'm going to kind of turn it around and we'll look at that lock stitch now and see how Jade's machine did in managing that lock stitch. Again, lock stitch is always going to be tougher for a machine. It's always going to be tougher because of having to pull that thread up through that thick layer of elk hide. It's fighting uh, friction. It's fighting uh, viscosity, everything else. kind of bending a little bit so I'm focused on the machine right now hopefully I'm staying on course I'm gonna do the two-handed approach here see if that's a little bit easier for me folks those are beautiful lock stitches as well that Jade's machine just laid down definitely gonna give that a page 34 okay let me get this other layer in place 
And what we're going to do now is go through two layers of genuine alkyd. And I'm going to do this with no music on. Let me change my camera angle again. Okay. And in Wisconsin, at least, I don't know where you're watching this premiere right now live, but in Wisconsin, at least, we're in spring, right? We're in May. April, April showers bring May flowers. So we're in spring. We're kind of in early summer sort of thing. Now look at the thickness of what we're going to do next. Yeah, I know. But uh, we still are having temperatures that are quite a bit cooler than uh, normally would be at this time of season. During the day, we're hitting the 50s, and at night, we're dropping all the way down into the 30s. So I just reached underneath the workbench and turned my heater back on because I thought, I, I don't need it, but it's getting cool down here again. As I had shared with somebody, uh, the workshop is underground, probably almost... 10 to 12 feet so it stays cool down here pretty much year round and in the winter time it is downright chilly it is downright chilly okay so let me do this I'm gonna do a quick wipe over on the bed a lot of those leathers leave kind of deposit a deposit behind I call them leather droppings All right, let's continue the process with uh, Jade's machine. So here again is, is going to be what I would consider to be a heavy-duty challenge, even for a light industrial machine, especially when it's being powered by uh, a Swedish uh, motor in this long stretch belt. You lose, you lose a lot of power exchange when you have a much longer belt like this, and especially when it's a stretch belt. So we'll see how it does in managing uh, two very thick layers of uh, genuine elk hide. I'm just going to check my belt alignment again. Looks like we're pretty good. All right, let's give this a go. Let's give this a go. I snagged something there. Yep, I did. Hold on a second. Oh, it's my thread again. My thread on top again unwound. Ugh. Oh, it really wound up. It wound around the spool pen this time again. It didn't do that when I was doing these off-camera ones. It didn't do that at all. Okay. I'm going to do that stitch line again because it's going to be wonky because that top thread was not feeding. It basically wound around the spool and the, the bobbin thread was trying to feed and the top thread was going, hey, where's my thread? It's uh, wound around the top of the machine. That's where it is. I'm actually going to take that felt off. Maybe that felt is causing me a little bit of trouble. It's not spinning true. All right, so we're going to try this again. This is the one that I just tried to do. And you can see the, the stitch quality we're getting is, is very good. It's that top row. Then all of a sudden, that top thread wrapped around the spool pin and, and locked on it. That's what you get when you don't have two threads, uh, or, or I should say one thread, generating a top and a lock stitch. You're only getting the bobbin that's working. So we'll run down another stitch line. And this time, hopefully, that, that that doesn't happen. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go right down the middle of these two. All right, let's give this a try again. All right, here we go. worked out better that time, didn't it? <laughs> All right, let me give that a clip.
Okay, so let's focus on, here, I'll do it like this. So, the first stitch row we did through the single layer is that top row right there, which you can't see. Hold on a second. The first row we did is that top row through a single layer of elk hide. And again, that, that stitch is exactly, exactly as it should be, that top stitch. Very pleased with that. The bottom row is the one that we tried when the spool of thread wound around, or when the uh, thread wound around the spool on top. And we were doing a solid stitch line there, and then that bottom row again, it locked up that top thread. I didn't see that. And then we had a blunder at the end. Then we did the middle row last. The middle row. And the middle row is exactly as it should be. I did see at the end of the run, we had a little bit of a hiccup where uh, that bobbin case kind of dropped attention for a second. So we don't have a real solid stitch at the end of this run. You'll see it when we get down to that point. Right about there. But that's one of those anomalies when you're, when you're dealing with a very tired needle and you're dealing with a genuine elk hide that is that thickness, or I should say two thicknesses, and that thread on the bottom in order to complete that lock stitch has to get pulled with that needle and that take-up arm all the way back up to the top. I'm not shocked at all to see that one little anomaly at the end of the run right there. If I had a brand new needle, if I were dealing probably with a thread different than upholstery, it probably would not have happened. But I look at the totality of the stitching between the three rows. Freeze frame right there. Between the three rows, again, the top row is the first one we did through a single layer. The next row down, the one in the middle, is the final stitch off we did. And then the bottom row is the stitch off we did uh, where the thread wrapped around uh, the bobbin spool, uh, excuse me, the, the spool pin on top and caused that thread to lock up so it wasn't feeding through the uh, tension discs. So all of those things together, um, I'm going to give it a pass. Going to definitely give it a pass. We turn it over. We can look at the lock stitch as well. We'll see the two rows, the one row that will kind of kind of stop, and then the second row that continued with that last sew off. We'll look at those two at the same time. And those lock stitches, without a doubt, from what we can see through the nap, are absolutely as they should be, absolutely spot on. Again, look at the thickness of that, folks. And again, we're using a very tired needle using upholstery thread. I'll pinch those together so you can see them kind of together. Actually, you can see them from this end, too. That's thicker than a man's belt. And it's not that we're using a light industrial machine. It's the fact that we're using a machine being powered by a Swedish 1.5 amp motor with a 110 size needle and upholstery thread. And that, le that needle I'm using is not a leather needle. So I'm impressed. Uh, Jade's machine did very, very well managing a very difficult task and laying down stitching that's absolutely break worthy. So I'm gonna throw that to the back. On top of that cowhide so off I did that was like blah, blah, blah. And now we're going to play Big Swing Band. Big Swing Band. I'm going to get a drink. And it might not be water after some of those sew-offs and challenges that I've already faced with this light industrial 95-60. <laughs> hey, we're not going to give up. We're going to keep driving. I didn't show you either, on top of here, 
is our pressure foot pressure right by all of the you know that huge matrix of oiling points and I'm also going to increase our pressure foot pressure just a little bit because you can see right now by the number of threaded points that are above the the top of the machine I don't have a huge amount of pressure foot pressure on there right now and that may have given me a little bit of a challenge when I did that cowhide so often it didn't feed real well so I'm going to bump this up a little bit All right, let's head back down to the needle. Also, look at those, look at those, that upper tension. That's the way it should look. Wait until you see the Facebook shots. All right, let's do some more sewing. I'm very impressed with this machine. Very impressed. All right, stay still, camera, stay still. That is a fun song. That is a totally fun song. And that one again is called Big Swing Band. Big Swing Band. All right, what do I have now? What, do I, what else do I have on here? I've got Commercial Canvas. I'm gonna do some Commercial Canvas now. And I know that if I understood Lynn correctly, um, Again, we just had a brief conversation about how Jade, Jade is her daughter, by the way, if I didn't say that already. Lynn is uh, Jade's mom. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how Jade is going to be using this 9560, but I believe she said something about fur, sewing fur and, and heavier stuff like that. So we're going to test a wide field of materials on this 9560. We're going to do this commercial grade canvas now, and we're going to do a total of six layers. And I've done six layers on non-industrial machines before, so it's nothing new. But um, it still remains to be a, a challenge for any machine uh, to sew at this level. So let's see, fold it once, get us up to four, and then get us up to six. So this is what six layers of commercial grade canvas looks like. Yeah, I know. But you know what? I don't want these premieres to be easy peasy. I want them to be a challenge. So I'm going to slide that into position. We'll see if we can go down and around with this. I've increased that presser foot pressure just a little bit so some of these materials where we have so many layers and or that the materials a little bit on the slippery side it's going to give us a little bit of better traction feeding the material over the feed dogs and underneath that presser foot. And I think I'd like to do this next sew off with the same song we just heard Big swing band. I'll just turn the volume down on it a little bit. A little bit more. There we go. All right, so again, I'm gonna give this a little bit of a hand start because of my uh, the way I have it set up with this motor and this long pulley uh, belt, and uh, we'll give this a go. All right, you ready? Here we go. All right, Let's see if I can do my turn successfully this time. Oh, wow, I'm getting better at this. I don't work with a lot of light industrial machines, although I like to. You might have seen that post I recently did of cruiser yachts that's based in Oconto, Wisconsin. They make these huge yachts for all the real wealthy people around the world. Uh, those folks had actually reached out to me and asked if I would service their light industrial machines, but because I'm blessed with so many customers sending me machines to the workshop, I had to say no, at least for now. I know, I know it was not an easy decision because that would be a lot of fun. That would be a lot of fun. All right, here we go to the finish and I'm not gonna close the box. Again, six layers of commercial grade canvas. We are like sewing a sailboat here, folks. Yeah, we are. Here we go. Oh 
only going to show a sailboat if I give it gas, right? Listen to that machine working. You can hear that machine just going dum 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 dum. All right, I'm back in my rhythm now. I actually made the turn, managing it with a hand start and pushing the foot control with my right hand and managing the material with my left hand. Like I said, I got a little bit of a circus going on today, but you know what? That's okay. I like to be challenged, right? I like to challenge the machines in the premiere, and then the machines say, okay, you're going to challenge us. We're going to challenge you, buddy. We're going to challenge you. All right, I haven't used Maddie's stitch holder, confirmation stitch off holder at all yet, but I think I'm going to do it right now. I think I will. We'll look at that top stitch first, and then we'll look at that lock stitch. Okay, got it in place. I'll put on a little bit of music while we're doing this. This is called, uh, what is it called? Swing, 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 bada bing. This is a real fun one. All right, let's take a look at these stitches. Again, we're talking about six layers of commercial grade canvas, folks. All right, I'm just going to say it. Page 34, without a doubt, without a doubt. Totality of the stitching. Well, let me just say this. Jade's machine, her model 9560, loves sewing commercial grade canvas. Yeah, it does. I'm going to turn it over and look at that lock stitch. So there you're seeing the totality of the stitching on the lock stitch, and I can already see that that is going to be wow. Let's zoom in on it. Again, we haven't made any adjustments to the upper tension. We made a slight bump up on the pressure foot pressure. And I think that was definitely the right move to make as far as bumping that pressure foot pressure up. Let me just tilt it a little bit more. I can see that I'm not tilted in relation to the angle of the camera quite right. There we go. That's a little bit better. You can still see it. Duh. You can definitely see the quality of the stitching. In fact, we'll kind of go like this. We'll look at a single row and kind of go around. And again, whenever you get to this level of sewing, I mean, you can look at it from the side right there, six layers of commercial grade canvas. Uh, you're going to see a little bit of a wiggle jiggle sometimes as you're going through that many layers. Absolutely gorgeous stitching. We'll look at it again with two rows at the same time. I am very, very pleased with that stitch off. Very pleased. I'll angle that towards the camera a little bit so you can again see the thickness of what we just did. Because I do this so I do this crazy level of sewing all the time and people just start to take it for granted because they expect to see it on this channel. Look at that from the side. See what I'm talking about? It is unlikely that even people that are making sales for a sailboat are going to be sewing through this many layers of commercial grade canvas. They're going to have canvas, they might have other layers involved, but to lay down stitches like this, 
through six layers of commercial grade canvas is just nuts. Look at that. That is totally page 34. So I'm going to throw that to the rear with our stack, our steadily growing stack of uh, confirmation sew-offs. And why do I say confirmation sew-offs? Type in the chat if you know why I, spe I specifically use that language, confirmation sew-offs. Type in the chat why you think, why do I, why do I say that? Why don't I just say sew-offs? Type in the chat if you think you know why I do that. All right, and while you're typing that in the chat, I'm going to put on a little bit more music for us. So that last one again was called uh, Sing, Swing, Bat a Bing. Yeah. This next one is called 1940s Slow Dance. You remember that when you were in school back in the day? Maybe in middle school going into high school or whatever in that in that grade group and they used to have dances and your heart would start to race as soon as the DJ or the band or whoever it was started playing a slow dance because then all the pressure was on you to walk up and ask that girl that was just so daggone cute if she would be willing to do a slow dance with you. Dancing with a girl at a fast dance or something like that, you know, regular style, you know, just doing your jam, that's not a big deal. But when you're all of a sudden having that hand-to-hand -hand contact with a girl, the one that you thought just a year or so earlier had cooties, ugh. I still have nightmares over that. 1940s, slow dance. Shake it off, 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 shake it off. Okay. <laughs> oh, people say if I could be forever young. I don't think anybody wants to be forever young. There was a lot of crazy stuff that happened when we were young, right? Yeah, there was. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to see if I've already done this. This is a type of Italian leather. I've done protected. I had my debacle with uh, Genuine Cowhide, although the machine did a great job. This, by the way, I didn't show you yet. But this is our sew-off sandwich so far. i got to turn my screen around. This is our sew-off sandwich so far during this live premiere. And I already showed you the pile of off-camera stuff I'd done before. So uh, let's just say that uh, Jade's machine is getting put through the paces today. I think that's pretty good. So I have not done this Italian leather yet. <clears throat> and you can see the back of it, it's just a totally different nap. But we're not going to have to contend with that nap as far as seeing the stitch quality because I'm going to uh, put these back to back with the finished side out on both sides. Now I can I can tell you you can't you can't feel this obviously through the camera, but this stuff is slicker than snot. So I just off camera real quick I did the a slight bump up even above what we had already done with that pressure foot pressure because this stuff is going to really mess with me like the cowhide did with in trying to keep it even underneath that pressure foot. It's going to totally mess with me. So I'm going to. I'm going to try to set myself up for success by giving us a little bit of a bump up on that presser foot pressure. And again, if you're brand new to sewing, if you're brand new to this channel, and I know folks learn a lot on this channel, even one of my good friends um, down in uh, Oklahoma who works with sewing machines a lot uh, said, I never knew about harp space until you talked about it on your channel, Scott. And that's... Uh, my good friend down there, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Binger, Mr. Binger down there in uh, Oklahoma. So, uh, pressure foot pressure is a science that is imperfect. When you're dealing with materials like this, you're dealing with two layers of Italian leather, very slippery stuff. 
those two layers, when they're matched up together, they tend to try to shift a little bit as you're feeding them over the feed dogs. And so a little bit more pressure, foot pressure is going to try to keep that material uh, grouped together more evenly and give you a little bit better even feed over those feed dogs when you're dealing with a slippery material like this. So we're going to give it a go. Uh, again, my whole goal during a premiere is not to, you know, not to do window dressing, uh, but to show that owner the majesty of their machine and how it's able to manage things so well, even if I miss the beat as I'm feeding that uh, genuine cowhide because my pressure foot pressure wasn't high enough or I lost focus for a second as I'm looking over to see if the thread is wrapping around the spool pin on top or if my belt broke again or something like that. As I'm managing all those dynamics during the live premiere, uh, that machine is still going to be doing its job flawlessly because of all the time that I've invested in it on this workbench. So, so sometimes machines will upstage us because we've done our due diligence we've done our work to prepare them for the premiere we might trip on the carpet but that machine is going to lay down stitching that is just absolutely the cats the cats meow so so great job for this 90 95 60 uh that belongs to Dre, uh belongs to jade blah, i'm gonna get a drink real quick this 95 60 that belongs to jade uh, because it's doing a fabulous job and it hasn't complained once about being powered by a Swedish motor. As a matter of fact, I think they, they have a little sweetness on each other. You know what I mean? I've never met a person that doesn't love a Swedish beauty, that's for sure. All right, let's see what else we got here. Looks like we've gone through all of our swing music. So I'm just going to pick something else out. Maybe we'll go to some banjo music. I never get tired of banjo music. All right, and I played I played some of these recently, so don't say, "Hey, you played that recently." I know. This one is called "Dance of the Fireflies." Dance of the Fireflies. As we try to do these two layers of super slippery, tricky Italian leather, we're going to go down and around. And I'm looking at the width of this thing, and I'm thinking, why? Oh, I know why. Because I didn't plan on sewing it like this. I planned on sewing it by folding it like this. Duh. I planned on sewing it like this, which is going to make it even more of a challenge for me to keep it even, kind of like with that cowhide. But I wanted to do a longer run is why I did this. All right, I'm going to move this over a little bit. We're not going to sew right down the middle. I'll see if this will help me to stay a little bit better on course. I hope it does. I hope I don't have a repeat of that genuine cowhide because that was just, ugh. that was worse than slow dancing with a girl back in middle school. All right, let's see how we do on this. Here we go. Stay even, stay even. She's starting to pucker up. She's starting to pucker up. I made it almost to the end. Come on. Work with me here. Work with me. That's a super long string to sew, folks, with one hand. Let me tell you that right now. And again, my failure to sometimes stay even is not the machine's fault. That's my fault. But in this case, I'm managing a lot, so bear with me. Bear with me as I try to fuddle through this. That is some nice looking stitching. That stuff is slippery though. I might have gone just up a little bit on that upper tension. I might have just gone up a little bit on that upper tension. I think our, our lock stitch looks okay. It looks fine, but it's a little bit weak. It's a little bit on the weak side. Matter of fact, we might sew down this one more time for kicks and giggles. But let me show you the stitching first. And I'm going to have to kind of feed it in front of the, uh, the presser foot because in the needle because it is super long. I'd say it's probably almost 12 inches long. So there is our top stitch right there, and I'm going to come in closer on that. You 
Yeah, I think that's better. Folks, I'm going to say it. Page 34. I'm going to grab it with the other hand and kind of feed it across there now. Because that's super long. I'm still going. I'm still going. We're still going. We're almost at the end. Almost there. There it is. Folks, that is totally a page 34. Don't you agree? If you agree that this machine just managed these two th layers of Italian leather that is incredibly slippery and tricky to sew, as I demonstrated by not being able to sew very straight. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Uh, type in the chat, page 34, or type in a thumbs up or a smiley face or something, because Jade's machine just did a bang-up job. Of managing this this is a very very hard very tricky sew off and it did a fabulous job fabulous job with a very tired needle by the way so I'm going to turn it over now we're gonna look at that lock stitch the lock stitch I'm not quite as jazzed over because I think that we're a little bit weak on that upper tension and it might just inspire me to sew down one more time depending on what I think after I look at them all yeah I think I'm, I probably will I'm just going to turn it like this and point it so that that stitching is on top. It's easier to see. Yeah. Yeah, we needed more upper tension. Again, this material is very tricky when it comes to uh, manipulating stitching. And we're kind of on again, off again with this as far as that stitch integrity being maintained. And it's because our upper tension was a little bit insufficient for the task of sewing these two layers of Italian leather. So let's do this. This is our top stitch. I'm going to put that underneath the presser foot again. I'm going to bump up our upper tension just slightly. And then we're going to revisit these stitches again. Let me just see which side is going to be easier for me to manage. Yeah, I'll try going down this side. I'm going to have to do a little bit of steering. And I'll do my best to steer it down this path. So I'm just doing a slight bump up on our upper tension. About a full turn. And now we're going to try sewing down this uh, these two layers of Italian leather one more time. Seeing if we can tighten up that lock stitch just a little bit. Alright, are you ready? Alright, here we go. I totally redeemed myself on that one. I totally redeemed myself on that. I'm managing the foot controller with my right hand. I'm maneuvering the material as it's being moved by this industrial machine with my left hand, steering it down, and we made it all the way to the end. Okay, I, I'm, I'm done. I feel totally good. Oh yeah, I'm doing a little dance. I'm doing a little dance. <laughs> all right, don't get cocky, Scott, or you'll crash and burn again, buddy. You'll crash and burn again. And again, when you're making a, a tweak up like that to try to define that lock stitch better on a second run, you don't want to go crazy in turning it up too far. Because if you increase that upper tension too high, what can you potentially do <clears throat> Excuse me, to your top stitch? Type it in the chat if you know the answer to that. If you're trying to get a better defined lock stitch and you bump up your upper tension too far, what can you end up doing? What can you, what, what can you end up doing uh, to create another problem? What, what problem can you create? That's kind of what I meant. <clears throat> I'm just looking at the stitching real quick. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. We definitely went the right direction. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is put on a little bit more music. We're going to look at these two stitch rows. And the stitch row on the bottom 
is the second stitch off that we just did on this same uh, slippery uh, Italian leather, these two layers. This one is called Ginormous Robots. I've played this many times for you. So as we're looking at these two rows of stitching, the top row is the first one we did. The bottom row is the second row of stitching that we did. And the concern that I had, if you, if you typed it in the chat already, then you get an A in the class for getting the correct answer. The correct answer is, as we're looking at that lock stitch and we're saying it's not as defined as we want it, and we're gonna bump up our upper tension, what you can do then is you can diminish the effectiveness of your top stitch. Because as you, as you bump up that upper tension, you're taking away the pull from the bobbin case below defining that top stitch. So if you go too far, you end up getting a substandard top stitch that was perfect before, but then all of a sudden you get a, a, an improved lock stitch. So you have to go just far enough to balance them without going too far, okay? And we accomplished that, at least from what I'm seeing with the top stitch. Again, the first row on top is the one we did first. The one on the bottom is the one we just did now. And we still have two very, very good looking top stitches. I'm gonna go all the way across so you can see them from start to finish. I'm looking over my shoulder periodically to make sure I haven't misaligned it. Looking over my shoulder again. Folks, that is, that is a, another page 34 top stitch. Now here we're gonna see the trick of the trade when I turn this over, you can see where I went off course a little bit again. When I turn this over, our second row stitching where we made that bump up on the upper tension to define the lock stitch better, that top row is gonna be our second sew off when I turn this over. Watch me turn it. Right now we're looking at the bottom row was our, was our second row. Now we're turning it over and now all of a sudden that lock stitch second row on top is the one we did after the change. Just make sure I'm correct. Yep, I am. So I'm gonna bring it all the way to the beginning. We're gonna look at it and see if we had a positive impact. We may have gone not far enough for this particular type of material. <clears throat> so again, top row is our second sew off. Bottom row is our first. I'm gonna pause right there. I'm definitely seeing an improvement, uh, but again, we're dealing with a tired needle, so it's, it's a little bit hard to say. It's a little bit hard to say. But really, when you look at both stitch rows, uh, there's a slight improvement on that top row as far as the evenness of the stitches and the stitch uh, formation. And yet on the bottom one, we also had some real good form too. So. Like I said, when you start to get a tired needle, it's a little bit harder to say, okay, yeah, we definitely made the, uh, we made the right choice, but we made an impact that was sufficient because of the factor that that, that needle is getting tired. I'm going to pause here too. So you can compare the two. We've got two good stitch lines, but I think that bump up on the upper tension to define the lock stitch on that top row was the right direction to go. It's just that our needle is getting more and more tired. So, so I'm going to give this a pass too. I know we spent a lot of time looking at this, but I, I really wanted to emphasize the fact that it's easy to fix problems if you know what to do. So when you see a weaker lock stitch, bump up your upper tension. When you see a weaker top stitch, back off your upper tension. And you'll get stitch quality like this, even with incredibly difficult materials to sew like this Italian leather. So I'm going to throw that to the back as well. Some beautiful stitching on the part of this uh, 9560, that's for sure. All right, what do we have next? Yeah, we need something a little goofy after all the serious side of the challenges that we've had with the materials and, and all the other things, the 
thread wrapping around the spool pin on top and all the other challenges. We need something silly like barnyard surprise, barnyard surprise. All right. Now we got some of this uh, commercial upholstery material. We got some of this commercial upholstery material now, and we're going to do six layers of this, just like we did the commercial canvas. I'm just going to get it lined up. Yeah, I'll face the lighter side out. See, this is the lighter side. The other side's a little bit darker. So, this side right here. Compare this to that. Let me give this a full. We'll get up to six layers, and then we'll give this a go. Four layers, and there's six layers. That's six layers of commercial upholstery material. Again, even a professional upholsterer is not likely to be using six layers of upholstery material. And I've actually sewn this on non-industrial Singer machines successfully as well. So we'll see how this industrial model 9560 does with a task like this. And we'll try to go down and around with this down and around. All right, take up arm at the highest position. All right, let's see if we can launch into this and see how this machine does. It's done a wonderful job in managing this diverse field of sew-offs and thicknesses. And uh, we'll see if we can finish the course with uh, a successful sew-off on this commercial upholstery material. I think I've got some bubble gum material too we might try. Uh, and you'll see why I call bubblegum material if you're new to this channel. All right, here we go. Six layers of commercial upholstery material. I'm reaching across right now, letting go of the material to give it a brief hand start. Got to do that with the setup I have right now with this belt. And uh, we'll give this a go. And this belt is held out. I'm surprised. The other one broke with just one sew off on that mini clip I did on Facebook. And this one has continued to stand up against all of this abuse. I think I've been more abused than the belt, but hey, whatever. All right, here we go. Six layers of commercial upholstery material. Here we go. Whoops. My, I'm going to stop right there. Because I looked up, and look at what happened. Let me shift the camera real quick. I actually looked up because I was kind of monitoring it. Look at what happened to my thread up top here, because this stuff is real springy. See that thread is starting to work itself off the bottom of the spool. So I got to fix that real quick. Otherwise, we're going to have a repeat of that other saw off. Watch what happens when I lift it up. See that? And that's just the nature of upholstery thread. It tends to be a little bit springy, more springy. It tends to be a little bit heavier. And it was doing pretty well up until that point. And then it just decided to mess with me again right there. So, so it, it doesn't seem to make a difference with this particular thread that I picked. It doesn't seem to make a difference of whether I'm using it without a felt or with a felt. So I'm just going to stay. I'm going to stay the course with what we have right now, and I'll just try to keep an eye on it to see if we have an issue with it uh, feeding again. We're coming off of the, the spool and going onto that spool pin underneath it. So I'm glad I caught it that time at least. All right, let's resume sewing. And I'll kind of be keeping half an eye on that while I'm managing all the other things down at the needle. All right. Here we go. Yeah, 
thread is thread is going to be a little bit of a challenge, I think. Let me let me just kind of unwind it again, and it started to work its way off of the bottom of that spool again. And this is kind of what I'm managing right now. And it's partly because the the surface on top of here is a lot wider than most spool mounts for machines and it just gives it the opportunity to kind of spin a little bit more freely. Spinning a little bit more freely than it should be. Stop that! <laughs> Alright. I'm going to make my turn now. And then we'll head down to the finish. I said the machine has been doing a phenomenal job after I got done with restoring it um, but some of the other dynamics like the choice of materials choice of thread thread that's being naughty naughty thread it's doing it again some disgruntled employee at the factory making this upholstery thread gave it extra spring I want his name I want her name all right down to the finish here here we go If you could see me, I'm like, my head's like going back and forth as I'm watching what's happening down at the needle, and I'm watching that spool of thread, almost like, you know, kind of giving it that glare, like, don't you dare, don't you dare do your weird thing. <laughs> ah, ah. Oh, gosh, we just have too much fun. We just have too much fun. All right, let me give this a clip. And again, uh, this particular model, the 9560, is not able to make larger stitches like some of the household machines where you can get, say, six stitches per inch. You're, you're only going to be able to get about between eight to ten stitches per inch on the, on the largest setting for this machine. So if the stitches look a little bit smaller than you're accustomed to seeing them, that's because of the engineering of this machine. It's not the fault of the machine. It's just how it was made. It was made to make... Uh, stitch uh, stitches that are a little bit on the smaller scale. All right, so let me get my stitch confirmation stitch holder, and we'll see if we can take a look at these stitches as I'm bending this material back to get it to lay here. Yeah, we've had our share of challenges during this premiere, but that's okay. Challenges are no big deal as long as we can overcome them, and we did every single time we had a challenge. Uh, we overcame it. That's part of the reason I don't edit, is I want you all to see that you can have challenges, because you're going to have them in your sewing space, in your creative space at home, too, or in your workplace. This next one is called Arkansas Traveler. Arkansas Traveler. Turn that volume way down. All right, let's take a look at these stitches. Again, this is commercial upholstery material. I'm going to say it, folks. Page 34. Let's zoom in even closer. That is definitely a page 34. Holy mackerel. Jade's machine loves upholstery material too. And you know, I'm just being figurative because it's really a product of how the, the type of needle I'm using, which is a size 110, size 18, uh, and upholstery thread is interacting with this particular type of woven material. 
So, uh, you know, your choice of needle does play into things. If I were using a leather needle right now, we'd be able to push that sti stitch definition up. Even using a size 110 needle, we'd be able to push that stitch definition up considerably on the different leather sew-offs that we did. We still got great outcomes. It's amazing. But, and, that's a, and that's a product and an accolade for this machine now that it's been restored. But Jade will have to make those choices depending on what her project goals are and her material choices on the type of needle that she's going to choose. And I'll help her with that. I'll be glad to help her source these specialty needles that she's going to need. But all in all, for general sewing, the needles that I've gotten for her are going to do a fantastic job. Uh, as you've already seen during this premiere, just a fantastic job. Let me turn it over. Let's look at that lock stitch. And I haven't done anything else with that upper tension. We'll see if our upper tension is continuing to manage that lock stitch well or whether or not we should have gone up or down with it. Look at both at the same time and then kind of Yeah, I'm going to pause there for a second and just say this. Based on the overall presentation of the stitch, uh, the spacing of the stitch, the integrity of the stitch, um, I would definitely give it a page 34. However, I also notice when I look at those stitches very, very carefully that they've also been compressed a little bit. They've been compressed just ever so slightly. And type in the chat, why would a lock stitch get compressed slightly depending on the layers that you're sewing, the type of material you're sewing? What would cause that stitch to become minutely compressed? Type it in the chat right now, would you please? And I'll kind of move across this top row. Those are gorgeous right there, aren't they? Gorgeous, gorgeous stitching on the part of this uh, industrial machine. So again, six layers of commercial uh, grade uh, upholstery material, folks. So you've had time to do it by now. If you typed in the chat, Scott, a, a, a lock stitch can get compressed slightly if your upper tension is turned up too high. If you type something to that effect, you get an A in the class for the day because that's exactly the correct answer. And the same thing could be true of the top stitch. If the top stitch looks a little bit compressed, stubbied out a little bit, where it's, it's not as long as it would be normally, then that's an indication in that case that the uh, bobbin case is pulling down too hard, right? Now that's not taking anything at all away from uh, the beauty of the stitching that Jade's machine just laid down. It's absolutely gorgeous stitching. It's absolutely brilliant stitching. But when I'm analyzing a stitch, I try to be very, very fair handed about assessing it and while this is page 34 page 34 means near perfect stitch which that little margin where we could improve even more would be if we were sewing a ton of this upholstery material this commercial grade upholstery material I would back off that upper tension just slightly so we would get the fullness of that stitch back on the lock stitch it's near full but it's it's just it's just I'm going to use a fun word. It's, it's just stubbified slightly. And that's because the upper tension is pulling up too hard. But overall, the impression of the stitching, wow. Again, we're talking six layers of commercial grade upholster material, folks. Look at that. Six layers on a very tired needle, may I say, also. And yet, uh, Jade's machine 
just knocked it out of the park again. And with a lock stitch. Lock stitches are so much harder to have success with. So I'm going to throw that to the rear as well with our mounting pile sew-off sandwich, which I'll show you real quick. This is what we've sewn so far on camera today. A diverse field of materials, everything from commercial upholstery material to commercial canvas, alkyde, Italian leather, cowhide, protected full grain leather, and even a light sew off on a cotton polyester blend. Anyone that would try to argue that I didn't put this machine to the test and do a fair assessment of it through a wide range of confirmation sew offs, y'all need to lower your medication because that would be anything but true. This is the type of confirmation sew offs that I do because when this machine leaves the workshop, when it graduates, I want that owner to, having, having watched this premiere, to say, I never knew my machine could sew that. I never knew my machine could sew that many layers. I never knew it could handle six layers of upholstery material that's commercial grade. I never knew it could sew elk hide. I didn't know it could sew leather. You know, I get that a lot from owners that say, holy macro, I had no idea until I watched that premiere and I saw what you put my machine through that it could handle all of that, and by the way, not just handle all of that, but deliver stitching that's absolutely break worthy, like on this protected full grain leather right here. That's what it's all about, folks. That's the real deal. That's what you get on this channel. You don't get window dressing. You don't get all kinds of people editing this, editing that. You see the real deal on this channel, and I think that's why I have such a loyal following of, of friends that love to watch me do this kind of st stuff on these videos on these premieres because they said you know what this dude gives us the real deal I think it was my friend Doc Rogers yeah it was out in uh, New Mexico that said to me Scott I love the fact that you just show it the way it is John Smith said the same thing down in Florida he said I love it that you show you show your struggles but then you show your success by overcoming those struggles that's the real deal right there folks that's the real deal I had to adjust my machine a little bit. That belt was kind of feeding crooked a little bit. So, all right. We could just stop here. You know that, right? We could just stop here. But I've got a couple more things I'd like to put this machine through and see how it manages it. Because it's, it's a tough challenge. I love to give tough challenges. <clears throat> so that was Arkansas Traveler. Now we're going to do Men at Work. Men at Work. And if any of you are about in the same age bracket as me, you might remember there was a band back in the 70s. Maybe even into the 80s, I don't know. But they were called Men at Work. And they did some fun, fun songs. Yes, they did. This is not their work here, but it's just the title of the song. Men at Work. Boy, they did a lot of fun stuff. I think they did YMCA too, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Type in the chat if I'm right that Men at Work, that group from the 70s or whatever it was, they did that song that became so famous, YMCA, da 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 YMCA, da 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 you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they were a fun group. And they always dressed up in the most outrageous costumes, didn't they? You remember that? They had the Indian and they had other, they had, they had all kinds of, what would be considered now probably socially inappropriate things, but whatever. I think sometimes people are just a little bit too sensitive, but that's my opinion. All right. What are we going to sew now? Should we do some bubblegum material? I think we should probably do some bubblegum material. All right, I'm putting the other things I had duplicates of to the side for right now. I've already done elk hide. We really only have one sew off left, y'all. I thought we had two left, but we have one left because I had some duplicates. I had duplicates of the commercial canvas, commercial upholstery material. I had duplicates of the cowhide. 
I should almost sell the cowhide again to redeem myself on the cowhide too, shouldn't I? I really should. I totally should. I'm gonna do it. All right, let's do bubblegum material first and then we'll do cowhide. <clears throat> so, this is like way too big of a piece, but. How many layers do I wanna do? Two, four layers? Should I do four layers of this? Let me cut this down a little bit. I hate the waste material. All right, so we had we had more than enough material. You can see that in the shot. See that? Two layers. I'm gonna get rid of that one. We'll save that for another day. And we'll do three layers of this bubblegum material. Oh, I didn't show you if you're brand new to the channel why it's called, why I call it bubblegum material. Check this out. See that? See it stretch? Watch it stretch here too. Wow, 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 wow. Yep, that's the playroom side of things right there. Have fun. When in doubt, have fun. So I've got three layers of this bubblegum material. It looks like that. Let me show it from this end. That's what three layers of bubblegum material looks like right there. A high concentration of vinyl in this stuff. And I've had other people say to me, well, what's, it's got vinyl for sure, but what else is in it? A little bit of leather. What else? I have no idea. It's just fun. It's just fun to sew because it is so tricky when it comes to what it wants to do to that stitching. All right, so press your foot is down. And I know I've got more than enough presser foot pressure, even for this real stretchy, slippery bubblegum material. So that one was called Men at Work. Now we're going to do, and, and some of you have heard these before, so let me pick something else. we got Jessica. Y'all have heard Jessica before. Horses and Trains. I don't know if we've heard that one any time recently. So let me put Horses and Trains on. <coughs> Ooh, this is fun. Let me turn this up, for now at least. Oh yeah. Does anybody like horseback riding? Or anybody own horses? If you like horseback riding, or you like horses, or you've gone horseback riding, or you've looked in a book and you've seen the picture of a horse, and you, you can identify it readily, type in the chat, I know what a horse is. No, if you want to share anything about horses, it'd be totally cool. Go ahead and type it in the chat for fun, would you? Come out of the shadows and tell us your greatest tale about horses when you lived in the Great West. Yeah, do that, would you? Mm -hmm. All right, let's throw some bubblegum material. All right, I'm inspired. We're sewing bubblegum material. I gotta pop a piece of double bubble into my mouth right now. Yeah, I do. And if you're wondering, did he really put it into his mouth? You never know, kid. You never know. All right, three layers of bubblegum material. Here we go. can see that already. Our bobbin is uh, struggling to finding that top stitch. So what I'm going to do real quick right now off camera, I'm going to back off that upper tension a little bit to give victory back to the bobbin. Because this is a totally different material we're working with right now. And it obviously is it's losing the battle against that upper tension. So I'm going to back it off just about three quarters of a turn. It was a fun song, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. There we go. That's called a midstream adjustment. That's called a midstream adjustment. I'm just going to take a closer look. I even turned it just a little bit further. All right, down to the finish on three layers of bubblegum material. 
and we'll try to see what impact I made where I made that tension adjustment. As a matter of fact, I'll mark it. I'll mark it with a silver pencil. Silver pencil. Silver permanent pen is what I meant to say. All right, here we go, down to the finish. Yeah, that was the right choice. I could have even backed it off a little bit further. All right, let's take a look at this. Yeah. I'm going to go down the middle of this and adjust it back even a little bit further and we'll give some of the victory back to that top stitch. Because that lock stitch is a little bit overemphasized right now on the bottom. You'll see what I mean. You'll see what I mean. All right, that's to the rear. Yeah, I got to go even further back. All right, I'm going to go down the middle now. I'm going to go down the middle with this bubblegum material. I just bumped that upper tension back even a little bit further. And let's see if we can impact this final stitch row in the middle to give greater emphasis to that top stitch. Because right now we've got an overly poppy lock stitch and we've taken away too much from the top stitch. Here we go. There we go. Now we're starting to get back in the line. Now we're starting to get back in the line. Could even go a little bit further than that. Could even go a little bit further. But I'm going to stop there for now because we know the direction that we have to go. We've got to, we've got to back off that um, upper tension even more than I did. I was kind of conservative because, again, I, you don't want to overdo it or you're going to steal too much away from the lock stitch. But I could have gone further. I could have definitely gone further. But again, realize this. We're working with a commercial machine, 95-60 Singer, that has a maximum stitch range of 8, 8 or 10 stitches per inch down to about 28 stitches per inch. So we're dealing with a more condensed stitch size using upholstery thread and a size 110 needle, size 18. So I'm impressed with what we have, but I'm always looking for better. So we could even improve we could improve this further by backing off that upper tension even more. All right. Let's take a look at this. We're going to be looking at the top stitch first. And the little uh, silver mark you see on the left side of the material is the one that I marked when I saw that stitch line going down and I saw saw right away that the bobbin case was losing the battle and maintaining a good top stitch I backed off that upper tension went around so I could have gone even further so then I ran that last stitch row down the middle but I could even go further than that now as I'm looking at the stitch integrity of that top stitch So the last one is called Horses and Trains, and this next one is called Story of a Toy. Story of a Toy. That's a fun title, isn't it? Story of a Toy. Oh, this is a fun one. I like this. So when you're, you can see how that, um, if I stop bumping the camera, you can see how that, uh, you can see how that bubblegum material, when you're dealing with three layers of it, creates almost a puckered quilting effect in between the stitch lines. Can you see that in the middle? Those two, those two sections that are kind of puckered up a little bit. So it's an incredibly tricky material to sew, especially when you get up to a size 110 needle. 
This material is much easier to sew in the range of say a size 90 or even a size 80 needle versus 110 size 18. So, so we're battling a couple of things here. We're battling using heavier thread, size 89 upholstery thread. We're battling using a size 110 uh, universal style needle. And then we're doing three layers of this stuff. I mean, we're pretty much going up against the impossible, but we still had success, which is pretty cool. I'm gonna move that just a little bit further on the angle. We're still having some level of success and I'm, I'm very pleased with it. But again, we could bump up that, uh, excuse me, we could bump down that upper tension just a little bit more to get even better stitch definition on this real tricky bubblegum material. But that final row of stitching in uh, the middle in particular is starting to go to the direction that I want to see. Just a little bit more bump bump down on the upper tension and we'd be right, we'd be spot on. Well, you can see on the ends there where we definitely didn't have enough upper tension because you can actually, let me take my hand off the camera here. You can actually see some of the knots. See those knots? Where there wasn't enough upper tension to pull that, that thread line taut and pull that thread all the way back to those three layers of this heavily, um, Heavy, heavily laden uh, vinyl material, this bubblegum material, there wasn't enough upper tension to pull that stitched uh, tight against that material on the bottom. So much so that you can actually see the knot where the knot should have been pulled up in the middle of the material to define that stitch and it clearly wasn't. So there we had we had a clear sign of insufficient uh, upper tension. Wait a second, reverse, reverse. We're looking at the top stitch right now. Let me get my head straight here. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're looking at the top stitch right now. So what we're seeing here with seeing those knots is we're seeing that the upper tension was too high because it pulled that knot towards the surface of the material instead of allowing it to remain in the middle of the material. That's what I meant to say. I'm chewing this bubble gum and it's totally distracting me. I'm gonna spit it out. All right, there we go. So yeah, I mean, if your upper tension is too high and you see that knot, that's an indication that the bobbin case below is losing the battle. So that's where we backed off that upper tension. And when we finally did that stitch row off, that stitch uh, row in the middle, we clearly had given the victory back to that bobbin case because you're not seeing that knot like you are here on the side panel. And that was even after our initial adjustment. See that little silver mark I did is when I adjusted that upper tension back so that that bobbin case should have had greater victory, but it still wasn't enough. And even in that final row of stitching we did down the middle, with all the adjustments down to that upper tension so that that top stitch could be better defined, we were still not giving enough of the victory back to the bobbin case. So, but it's obviously an improvement as you go down the stitch line and look at that middle stitch line. We're going the right direction. Just not far enough. Alright, let's turn over and look at the lock stitch. I'm already anticipating a very nicely defined lock stitch and, and a little bit overly emphasized lock stitch. But even as we get ready to do that, looking at this top stitching, taking into account a very tired needle, taking into account a very large needle going through this vinyl-based material, this bubblegum material, and using a very heavy thread, size 89, uh, I'm going to give that a near page 34 rating. As you look at it yourself, you can say, yeah, I can see that. I can totally see that because the stitch integrity, the stitch spacing is really spot on. The machine is doing an excellent job of managing three layers of very, very slippery, tricky bubblegum uh, material. It's just a matter of getting that stitch uh, tension balance between the top and the, the lock stitch, getting it just spot on. 
and on some of the other materials we were we were struggling a little bit with maintaining good stitch uh, clarity on the lock stitch and in this case because our stitch uh, tension had been bumped up to manage those other materials here it was too high up to manage this vinyl base material and we had to bump it back down again so it has to be done folks it's just the it's the reality when you're working through a diverse field of materials and thicknesses there's no way in God's green earth your your upper tension is not going to be able to remain unchanged if you're going to maintain good stitch integrity it's got to be done it's just a matter of knowing what to do and understanding the concept of the tug of war that's going on in getting that sweet spot on your your stitch balance and we're heading the right way in this one I'm really happy with what I'm seeing on that middle row we just haven't gone quite far enough all right with all that said let's turn it over and look at the lock stitch again a vinyl base material hold on a second a vinyl base material that is incredibly difficult to sew customers that have gotten this material because I always send the sew offs with the machine as I'll do in this case for Jade when customers feel this material and they actually stretch it themselves and they're kind of goofing around with it a little bit and they're trying to sew it themselves they're like holy mackerel I had no idea so here you can see right away straight away we've got what I would consider to be a page 34 lock stitch near perfect but the distinction is that it's it's hyper emphasized and by hyper emphasized I mean that our upper tension was high enough that it actually has compressed those stitches just ever so slightly pulling up too hard uh, while that bobbin case was screaming for help so that it wouldn't lose the integrity of that top stitch does that make sense it's a tug of war back and forth back and forth bobbin case pulling down upper tension pulling up and when you're dealing with a tricky vinyl based material like this bubblegum material that battle becomes even more intense because it's a real real I mean, it's not a rigid material that's going to give you some stability. It's fluxing, it's stretching. It's a real tricky material to work with. And that's why I love it. I love it because I want to show you guys something that's challenging, something that causes you to go, holy cow, wow, wow. <clears throat> and it's okay to encounter challenges <clears throat> as long as we overcome them. All right, round up on the prairie is the next one. Round up on the prairie. So I already know that these are going to be page 34. The ones on the other side, the ones in the middle were getting near page 34. I called it a near page 34 on the top stitch on this. Three layers of bubblegum material, vinyl based. But these are definitely page 34. They're just a little bit compressed because that upper tension was set too high. But look at that stitching. It just gives you an idea of how beautifully Jade's machine stitches and it's just a matter of managing tension and if she sticks with a certain uh, material all the time she finds that sweet spot she's got it made she doesn't have to do any of the jumping through hoops that I've had to do during this premiere I'm just gonna push it up a little bit because I can see it's curled down so you can see that stitching too it's absolutely spot-on <clears throat> if I can go like this and maybe make it even easier for us Turn it upside down. Turn the world upside down. So these, this is an example of a machine that is running at the top of its game. Sewing stitching like this and laying down uh, stitch quality through really tricky material. And it's just, it's without missing a beat. Without missing a beat. So I'm going to definitely give this a pass too and just, you know, lesson learned. Lesson learned in this classroom. It's all about learning, right? As you're changing material types and thicknesses, you've got to manage that dynamic of the stitch balance. Especially if you're working with a needle or a thread incompatibility or a needle thread combination that's a little bit more challenging like we are here. I mean, size 18 needle, size 110 is huge. 
it's a huge needle. But this machine could even take a larger needle. And then Jade will have to look at choosing a thread that will be compatible with that type of needle. She might decide to work with leather needles for this machine as well. And then you again have to look at compatibility. Because the thread and the needle have to work in concert together to lay down a page 34 stitch like you're looking at on screen right now. So I am incredibly pleased, incredibly pleased with how uh, Jade's uh, 9560 has managed all of these challenges. I mean, we've given it a slew of challenges. And it has not, I mean, it, it has not failed us once in delivering. So a true testimony to a machine that is restored properly, it's going to deliver even if the operator sometimes misses the mark a little bit. All right, we're done. I'm only going to do one more sew off to redeem myself, try to redeem myself. I may fail again, you never know, because cowhide is tricky stuff, it truly is. But I'm going to do one more sew off with this doggone genuine cowhide just gave me a, a hill of trouble, a hill of beans of trouble. Beans of trouble. And I'm going to try to do it one last time on Jade's machine. Yeah, the machine has done great. Let's see if I can redeem myself in being able to do this final sew-off on Jade's machine. Corn Cob Country. Yeah, this is the kind of sew-off music I want. All right, let's do this. All right, I'm going to give it my best, folks. I'm going to give it my best. Down and around. It's still not completely on course, but I did better in managing it that time, doggone it. All right. I actually did a lot better in managing it that time than I did the first time. The first time was a nightmare. It was like, ah, help! All right, down to the finish. Let's see if we can finish this off, and, uh, and then we'll wrap this premiere up with looking at some of the progress shots on Jade's machine on Facebook. Here we go. Oh, that was a huge improvement. I did redeem myself. Yay! I did. All right. Oh, you know what? I forgot to adjust my upper tension back up for leather, though. But we did well. We did well. We did really well on this. All right. I know it's hard, Dr. Singer. I totally get it. And thank you for that. Dr. Singer, you may have not heard Dr. Singer say it, but he just said, Scott, you... You always overcome your obstacles. You always overcome your obstacles. Rangers lead the way. hoo -ah! Yeah, they do. That was pretty good, Dr. Singer. I wish they could hear your voice. You've got a better hoo -ah than I do. All right. Oh, this is some beautiful stitching. What a great way to end. Not only to show again how great this machine is and how much Jade is going to have fun with it, but to redeem myself after sewing this cowhide on that other long strip and good gravy it just it, it was a humbling experience let's just say that that was super humbling and you know what they say about humility humility is a strange thing the moment you think you have it you lost it so I'm not even gonna think about it I'm just gonna take it chalk it up as experience right chalk it up as experience all right, let's look at this stitching, the final sew-off that I did as a rewind to redeem myself for that horrific experience of sewing that long strip of genuine cowhide before. But we still made it through that, too, which is pretty incredible. 
So let's let's put on some more fun music. I don't think we ever heard this one before. Cattails Thatched Villages. I would I would remember that title. I would totally remember that title. Yeah, it's kind of a cool one. Kind of a mellow jello one. I'm okay with that. All right, so we're looking at our top stitch now. It's going to go down and around. Well, you can see right now at the at the launch of this stitch off here that that bobbin case can flex its muscles again and say, "I got this. I got this." I was struggling with that bubble gum material, those three layers of bubble gum material. I was trying to trying to really work on defining my top stitch, Scott. I worked so hard. I struggled, you helped me out, you backed off that upper tension, we started to go the right way, victory, victory. But on this one, I don't need your help, Scott, I got this, I got this. These two layers of genuine cowhide, look at that top stitch, look at that top stitch. Page 34, folks, page 34. Totally, page 34. Oh my goodness gravy, look at that. See, that's the only spot I went off right there. Look at that, not bad, not bad. Beautiful stitching. Let's look at the two rows together side by side. And again, this is a product of the bobbin case. This is not the original bobbin case we're using. Remember, it's that aftermarket one that I got. I got two of them for Jade because bobbin cases will burn out with these high-speed industrial machines. And it's got that extra little spring buffer in the back of it I showed you on camera that kind of allows that bobbin to have a little bit of flux forward and back. I'm liking it. I'm liking it a lot. Let's turn it over and look at the lock stitch. Got a little curly whirly going on here, so we're gonna have to kind of peek around that curly whirly a little bit to see the stitching. Yeah, I'm I'm satisfied with that. I'm satisfied with that. It a little condensed, minutely condensed. It's definitely page 34 as far as the stitch integrity and the stitch presentation, but it's a little bit condensed. Again, we're talking about two layers of genuine cowhide, about six to eight ounces of leather. And again, this machine is only going to have the capacity to sew on the largest scale, eight to ten stitches per inch. And we've got some stitches that are absolutely break worthy. But I would, I would. <laughs> It's hard to say. Again, our needle is getting really tired. It's hard to say, but I would say that I, I would, number one, I would replace the needle. And I'll do that after this premiere. So when Jade picks it up, she's got a fresh needle in there. It's a beautiful stitch. It's a page 34 stitch, meaning near perfection. But I would back off that upper tension just a tiny little bit, just a smidge, just a smidge. And I would, I would, before I made that adjustment, I would, I would change out the needle based on the amount of sewing that we've done. But I'll tell you one thing, I feel redeemed because I did a lot better job sewing and staying on course with this genuine cowhide stitch off than I, than I did on the first one. And the machine has just performed beautifully through this entire premiere, just bang on. I love the UK people. She has, they have so many fun words, don't they? I still can't embrace the dustbin thing. If you want to throw something away, you don't throw it in the garbage. You don't throw it in the trash. You put it in the, in the dustbin. Shouldn't you have dust 
in a dustbin? Alex, I know you follow a little bit of my work, as busy as you are with your work over there in the UK. What's up with the dustbin? you got to help me understand that, buddy. You really do. All right. Yeah, I'm loving that stitching. I'm loving that. There you can really see it. I love that. Look at those two layers of genuine cowhide. And look at that stitching right adjacent to it. I'm a happy camper. I'm a campy happer. Yeah. So let's zoom out a little bit. Look at uh, Jade's machine from a distance again. Oh, and I, I need to give credit where credit is due. Great job, Swedish Beauty Motor, empowering us through this entire premiere. And great job, Belt, in not breaking. Great job, Belt. It's a makeshift setup, but it worked lovely. It worked lovely. All you need is weights and the bottom of a Husqvarna and a weird long belt. And yeah, you know what I mean. So this has been just a fabulous. We're going to look at some progress pictures now. Gives you an idea of just how fabulous the 9560 is. The entire class 95 series was just an incredible cluster of incredibly powerful and diverse and versatile industrial machines. The Class 95 is probably one of the best classes for industrial machines ever there was. I think I can say that, ever there was. Yeah, yeah, I just did. And uh, Jade's machine is a great example of that. And I think adding the ball bearings on the end, especially for high-speed sewing, what a great idea. So I'm going to put this to the rear as well, but I'm going to show you our sew-off sandwich for this live premiere. These are, these are none of the off-camera ones that I did. These are all ones that we've done during the course of this premiere. Because I don't want a, um, a machine to leave the workshop if it hasn't been put under the spotlights and given a genuine test. It's like the mini Olympics, folks, for sewing machines. The mini Olympics for sewing machines is what we just put Jade's machine through. And you know what? It got a gold medal. I got kind of a bronze medal, but then I got a silver medal on that last sew-off right here. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yes! All right, so I'm going to set those to the rear. I'm going to get our shots set up as far as Facebook because I want you to see that we wouldn't be able to achieve this level of success during this premiere with this machine if we hadn't taken it through my process, if I hadn't taken it through my process. I mean, that's just the reality, folks. That's just the reality. you got to, you got to go through the process to get results like this. And results as far as how the machine is sewing, but also um, how the machine looks. I've said it before, whether it's an industrial machine, a household machine, a commercial machine, if it looks better and feels better about itself, guess what? It's going to sew better. So you can see this was kind of our starting point with uh, Jade's machine. You can't really see the crustiness of it from this distance. It doesn't look half bad from this distance. But I'll tell you one thing, when we get into some of the detailed shots, you're going to go, holy mackerel, wow. There's Dr. Singer. We haven't seen him out here for a while. He's been so busy with Umi. Here's Umi in the background. There you can see a little bit more of uh, the crustiness of the machine. Particularly once we zoom in and look at that nasty sticker that somebody put on this machine right on the front of the pillar. Come on, folks. Really? It's one of these people that's trying to desecrate a vintage machine because they want you to buy one of their expensive plastic ones. That's their game. That's how they work. That's how they roll. So again, you just see that the, there's nothing spectacular about the machine. It's very grungy looking. Here you can't even read that brass plate that gives the uh, model number. You can't read the serial plate. The medallion looks pretty dull as well. See that? You compare that to... I've got to change my shot a little bit. Compare that...
to that. See that? Okay, there we got it. There we got it. Just showing you the different angles of the machine. Again, the overall length of this machine is comparable to a Singer 201-2. Very different looking balance wheel, isn't it? Very different looking balance wheel when you get into the light industrial phases. There you can see that oiling point that we looked at before on the machine. And again, you can just get the general impression of how grungy the machine is. Now, grungy is not a statement of vanity. In other words, the machine doesn't look sexy. It doesn't look, you know, presentable. Dirt inhibits a machine. It's a performance factor as much as it is an aesthetic factor. So when I talk about dirt, when I talk about grunginess, I'm not just talking about the machine doesn't look as pretty as it could be. That dirt inevitably is the tip of the iceberg showing what the inside of that machine is like as well and the fact that that dirt and grime and buildup and varnishing and rust and everything else is holding that machine back from being all that it can be. <clears throat> Another oiling point, they're all over the machine and you just have to be you just have to be mindful of that. You got to be mindful of all the oiling points on a machine like this that's designed for high speed or you can actually burn that uh, bearing pack out again the bearing pack is right in here and again just showing the lay of the land all the different critical oiling points on the machine Good old branding of uh, Singer Manufacturing Company. And there's that area where on the, the top of the tower by the needle bar and the presser foot bar, there's just a slew of oiling points. And even below that point, you can see the other oiling point as well where you have to depress that little spring to allow yourself to get the oil in there. There's the back of the machine. You can kind of see that presser foot bar that's controlled by by your knee when you're sitting at that commercial table so you can have your hands free to manage the material with both hands unlike I had to do through the entire premiere today where I was managing it with one arm I was like the one arm pirate trying to manage <laughs> more oiling points and there's the bar right there that controls the uh, presser foot going up and down when you have it mounted in the table now you're going to see a little bit clearer when you see the depth of the, the dirt and the grime on this machine. We're going to get to some of those shots where you're going to be able to see the impact that was brought. But just overall kind of a grungy look. Look at that upper tension. The upper tension again is going to control the success or failure of that uh, the success or failure of that uh, lock stitch and on camera it's not even showing it to the extent that it is I mean it was just it was incredibly filthy it was amazing that the thread could even pass between the discs you can see another angle of it there and just all the grime and built up built up on there so <clears throat> again the oiling points and again, it, the other thing you're seeing in that shot right there is the presser foot <clears throat> control that allows you to increase and decrease. Um, right now, it's pretty low. Um, a lot of threads exposed there. And again, you turn it clockwise to increase. You turn it counterclockwise to decrease. The thicker the materials, the slipperier the materials, the more layers of material you're working with, like the six layers of, uh, of uh, commercial upholstery material, commercial... Uh, vinyl uh, you need to increase that and you also need to increase it when you're managing sew offs like bubblegum material as well so we actually had some great outcomes with 
presser foot pressure that could have been improved on a little bit. Just going to get a quick drink. But again, oiling a machine like this, especially when it's going to be set up with a servo motor, is, is absolutely critical. Here you can see the varnishing and, and grime buildup on here through this uh, thread guide that comes off the top of the machine. And this oiling point even, you can see the varnishing buildup on there as well. It was just a very, very grungy, uh, dirty machine. <clears throat> and I'm glad I had the opportunity to get it back to where it needs to be. Again, not just from a standpoint of appearance, but performance. There's our faceplate area. <clears throat> Nothing ornamental about the faceplate on a light industrial machine. It's there to work. It's there to do a job. There you can see the presser foot area. And even the, the uh, bobbin cover and then the uh, feed dog cover as well just didn't have any sparkle to it. See that? There you can really see the kind of the chalkiness and the varnishing build up on that machine. And an industrial machine is a workhorse. It's a workhorse but by design, but it doesn't mean that it can't still be a machine when people walk into Jade's sewing space and they see that machine, they go, wow, that's a beautiful machine. That's an industrial machine? Because everyone always thinks of industrial as kind of plain Jane or even ugly. It doesn't have to be. <clears throat> Another shot of the rear of the machine there near the pillar and showing that control for the presser foot. I'm going to take the faceplate off now and kind of look into the machine a little bit. That's all buildup on there. And again, buildup is not just an aesthetic thing. It also comes down to how that machine is going to be able to do its job and function. Even on the spring stack for the presser foot. Just all kinds of grunge and buildup on there. <clears throat> that holds the machine back dramatically, folks. The capabilities and the performance of Jade's machine prior to me doing my restore and deep cleaning on it was night and day from what you saw in this premiere today. Just night and day. And what you're seeing right here in the middle, and uh, Lynn had asked about it as well when I posted these on Facebook. She said, what is that moppy thing there? Well, what they did with some of these light industrial machines is they would put um, almost like a moppy type material in there that would be a reservoir of oil, kind of like the pads on the Husqvarna Vikings. That was designed to provide more even and sustained lubri lubrication to the machine. Uh, but this one had become just caked in grease and it was just disgusting. And it had totally lost its purpose. It was no longer functioning as it was designed to do. So I ended up just throwing that away. And Jade could always add some other type of material in there. Matter of fact, I can give her some of it. The white material that I use oftentimes and soak that with some oil and just kind of keep that behind the presser foot and needle bar in that little space right there as a reserve for uh, sustained oiling to the uh, the face plate area components. I don't recommend doing that. Uh, if you remain a, a, a regimental person when it comes to maintaining the machine and regular oiling, again, about every uh, 8 to 10 hours of heavy uh, sewing, you want to be lubricating all of the points on the machine and not relying on a on a reservoir mop piece like this to do the job for you. <clears throat> Again, just the overall crustiness of the machine. That's kind of looking into the faceplate area as well. 
That's going to be part of the uh, presser foot bar right there. And you can see when they make these machines, they do a certain weld point along there. I almost thought it was a repair. And then I looked at it under magnification. Um, that's actually the way the machine was made at the factory. But it looks like it was repaired, doesn't it? More grunge. More grunge and more dirt. And there you've got that... Uh, reservoir pad in the back, the mop pad. And now we're starting to make an impact on restoring the machine to get rid of that, all of that buildup and, and all the stuff that's holding the machine back. The presser foot bar, the spring, the lever and everything else, we're going to be going through a process of restoring it back to the way it should be. Already making an impact on the spring over here. Now that's the upper part of the spring, and you can see the contrast there. You can still see that buildup on there very clearly. Still a lot of buildup on there to mitigate. Part of that, uh, the majority of that is varnishing. Some of that is also rust. And you can see what I mean when you look at that, uh, that little pad that would have been just behind the, uh, the needle bar and the presser foot bar. It is so grunged up and crusted that it's just not, it's not doing any good at all to that machine. So uh, Jade can come up with a much better solution than that. Uh, leaving that in there would have actually resulted in contaminating the machine uh, because of all the, the junk that's saturated and soaked into that uh, lubrication pad. <clears throat> There you're looking at uh, the inside of the faceplate to the rear of the upper tension, and that was also all crudded and crusted up. So that also had to be restored as well. Got the machine rotated back now. A lot of people neglect the critical lubrication points and proper deep cleaning and restorative efforts to the bottom of the machine as well. And that's such a critical part of the mechanics of the machine. You can't neglect it and expect to have an optimized sewing machine. We're kind of going right to left here on the bottom of the machine, looking at the different components. Look at some of the buildup right here. Just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Again, the, the level that this machine is operating at now compared to how it was operating when it was in this state... It's just absolutely night and day. A very dirty machine. Obviously, it's gotten a lot of use. Here we're at the bottom of the raceway, and uh, there's some varnishing and rust to mitigate near the hook system. Looking at the bottom of the cover that goes uh, adjacent to the uh, bobbin case in the raceway. Some nomenclature information on the parts. <clears throat> this is a spring return on the, on the bottom of the machine that controls uh, the feed dogs. Of the raceway area. Closer shot of it there. Looking up the pitman arm to the top of the machine. And the reason I take these pictures is I want to document the condition of the machine uh, for the customer. But also, if I, if I discover any damage, any cracks or anything like that, I want to highlight that as well. The part may still be serviceable, but it might need, to be, might need to be replaced in the future. I didn't find anything like that on this machine, but it's important to have those pictures just so we can document how the machine was. How does that look? Does that look optimized? Uh, no. No, that looks like it's holding that machine back dramatically, and it was. <clears throat> so...
what I'm doing now is I'm using the, the torch very carefully to, uh, to heat the uh, set screw that holds the upper tension in place so I can remove that upper tension and restore it properly. How does that look? Yeah, I know. And again, if you go to a local service center and you bring your light industrial machine in, none of these things that I ended up mitigating for uh, for Jade are going to be dealt with. They're all going to you're going to get that machine back and your upper tension as long as your upper tension does even a remote job of maintaining a lock stitch on their sew off. And again, their sew off is not going to be anything like my sew off sandwich. It's going to be uh, a single piece or, or excuse me two pieces of light material probably a cotton blend with a stiffener uh, in between kind of like the one sew off that I did in this uh, premiere like that so all of this you're gonna get all of this back when you pick up your machine and the well that your upper tension goes into is gonna look just like that when they get done with it So why is it important to mitigate dirt and grime and buildup and all the other stuff? Because it's ugly? Well, yeah, it is. But also because it's going to migrate. It's going to eventually migrate into the faceplate area and contaminate those parts. It's going to migrate through the machine and contaminate uh, you know, any of the other components of the machine that you rely on for that machine to work properly. Here we've got uh, the original bobbin case, upper tension, and then that moppy glob of a, you know, call a hazmat crew uh, sitting right there that eventually I threw away. Using a solution here to do some cleaning. All different types of solutions I use in my restorative process. You can just see the filth on there, can't you? Build up here, here, here. And again, this level of servicing goes way beyond what uh, Jade and Lynn would have gotten for this uh, machine if they had taken it elsewhere. So I'm really glad they picked uh, the workshop to have this machine properly serviced. So it's going to be a tool for the long term to serve Jade for all of her sewing needs. Yeah, I'm just showing you the buildup. Even the presser foot was just bleh, bleh. More of a distant shot. I think that's kind of where we started. We came full circle, isn't it? Yeah, we did. So let me close that one. And now we'll look at the next set of uh, photos. There you can see me. I've got my magnifiers on. And I'm working on that uh, that model number badge mark because I think that's such a, a it, it, that could be such an ornamental beautiful piece on the front of the machine that Jade is going to be looking at when she's doing all of her work and all of her projects. Uh, it can be a point of pride. It can be a point of discussion even as someone looks at that plate and they can actually read it when I'm done doing my work on it and they can say, oh, that's a 9560. What does that mean? Here, let me show you Scott's premiere. <laughs> so there you're able to actually read the plate now after I've done the stripping down of all that junk that was on there. You can see the Q-tip swabs have all kinds of stuff. And now I'm working on the cereal plate. That was also very hard to read. That looked different. You can readily see the numbers now, and um, I mean, that's just the way it should be. That's the way it should be. Now we've got this god-awful sticker that they put on the front of Jade's uh, machine. Why sewing centers feel a compulsion to do that? I think it's passive-aggressive behavior. It's got to be. Because I know if I had stickers like that, number one, I wouldn't have stickers like that. But if I did, 
I would never, ever, ever put them on a conspicuous spot of the machine. Kind of like that recent premiere that you may have seen with uh, the machine that came out of Florida that was rust-ridden and everything, the 66-6. And they put that uh, hideous label right over the um, incredible uh, ornamental type decaling that's on the inside of the pillar. If you didn't see that, look up that video uh, and check it out. So here I'm kind of, I've kind of gotten so irritated by that ugly metallic sticker that I'm kind of ignoring it for a second and I'm working on some of the varnishing and some of the gunk that's on the paint surface. But I'll eventually attack that. But you can kind of just get an idea of how filthy the machine was if you look at that area above it and then you look at the painted spot that I just cleaned. It's, it's significantly different. And there's David's house of sewing. Yeah, David, you're going away, buddy. Bye, David. We're hitting you with uh, Goo Gone that my friend Paula Noel sent me. Bye, David. Bye. Bye, David. See you, David. Have a nice day, David. Bye. Aha. And the problem with those labels is even when you get the label off, there's this incredibly sticky glue base that has pitted itself into the clear coat that I mean you just have to hit it again and again and again and again and again and you got to be careful because then you'll damage the clear coat if you hit it too many times <clears throat> so I'm trying to be very careful and take it layer by layer down which is also time-consuming but to get rid of an ugly sticker like that no worries I'll spend half a day. They were really starting to make a good impact. You can see, starting to get all of that sticky stuff off, and it's actually popping up on the back of that cosmetic pad, and it's it's almost like a gluey substance. Uh, but it obviously turns brown with all the dirt and everything. Does that look different? You can actually see the reflection there in that same space where that hideous sticker was. And if we break away real quick from our Facebook and you actually look at the machine, that's where that ugly sticker was right there. Again, I don't get it. I don't get it. If you do a good job with sewing machines, people are going to remember who you are and tell other people about you. That's how my business grows. That's how I get new customers. So, I mean, you don't need these metallic stickers there's a conspiracy with a stick sticker company that's warping the minds of good sewing people that do restorative work and repairs and they're saying you need these stickers you don't you don't need those stickers and there's more of a distance shot but again showing you that space as we just looked at on camera here where that hideous sticker used to be well this is the really cruddy well where that upper tension goes and you can see I've already done a lot of cleaning in there to get it back to the way it needs to be. Doesn't that look better? I mean that's just it's dramatically better. And better is better is again not oh it looks clean, it looks pretty. It's functional now. Because any of that dirt and grime that stays in there is going to migrate and contaminate the machine. Here we're starting to impact some of the other areas of the inside of the faceplate area to get all of that cleaned up. And at the same time, I'm, I'm checking uh, to make sure the things are set properly. I'm checking to make sure things are aligned properly. Things are lubricated. If they need to be adjusted, they're adjusted. Like I said, these pictures, as extensive as they might seem, they, they miss a ton of the work that I do on the machines. Even the amount of time I spend to document all of this takes a significant amount of time. So if I were to go, I mean, totally in depth and cover every single step, I probably wouldn't get very many machines done. What did that Q-tip swab? Can you see that in the shot? I think you can. layer by layer there's no there's no shortcut there's no 
shortcut or hack to this. You just got it. It's just very labor intensive. Look at that now. That's the after. Well, that's not even really the before, the because be, I've already done a, a significant amount of cleaning over here. That's not even the before. That's kind of like the semi before. But that's the after right there. What a big difference. And I'm just showing you the oil cruddy soaked Q-tip again. <clears throat> Here you can see a lot of this stuff is just, I mean, it's just, it's dis just incredibly disgusting, isn't it? Incredibly disgusting. Combination of old grease, excessive oiling, rust, varnishing. You name it, it's got it. Here again, night and day. Night and day and how that entire assembly in the faceplate area is going to operate and do its job because it's no longer being held back by all that crud. <clears throat> That's the way it should look. And that's going to give Jade a great baseline and a starting point to be able to enjoy the full benefits of what this 9560 is able to do for her because it's totally optimized. It's not a matter of just looking pretty, but it's been cleaned, it's been lubricated, it's been adjusted, and it's functioning at the top of its game. <clears throat> There you can see the needle bar. And I didn't mention it, but there were parts on the machine in the faceplate area and also the balance wheel area that had to be replaced. Slowly working away at that varnishing and build up and grind. Step by step by step. Look at that now. You could almost comb your hair looking in that reflection. <clears throat> now there is a presser foot attachment that is definitely you. You. Yeah. And again, when you have a presser foot attachment that's all credited up like that, it's not going to be able to work as an equal partner with the feed dogs. That grease and oil buildup on there and everything else is going to inhibit its performance. There's the way it should be. And yes, you have to clean the bottom of a presser foot attachment too. You just don't want to create barbs on the bottom of it. Use anything excessively abrasive. It should be a smooth, clean surface. Look at those Q-tips. And that's only a small sampling of the Q-tips that were used to clean up that one part of the machine, that one tiny little part of the machine. And there's the final product of the way a presser foot attachment should look needs the look. I wouldn't even say should look, needs the look. Working on the needle bar and the presser foot bar now. Mitigating all the dirt, grime, rust, varnishing. Step by step. It's not a quick wipe and you're done. It's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. Really starting to make an impact now on Jade's machine. <clears throat> Focusing on that integral thread guide now that comes right off the top of the machine, feeds down into the upper tension. The back side of the plate that goes over the, uh, the raceway area, uh, the bobbin and such. Now I hate to harp on the same thing again, but you go to a local sewing center, they're not even going to look at this. And that is right above the area that feeds into the brain center of the machine, the raceway, the hook system. And guess what? That dirt and grime and all that other stuff that builds up on there, it's not going to stay in one place. It's not going to be good dirt. 
It's going to be naughty dirt and go in there and contaminate the raceway. So we got to get rid of it. We got to get rid of it. Does that look different? Yeah, it does. And again, it's not a matter of just being shiny and pretty. It's a matter of being cleansed and ridded of all the junk that is going to eventually work its way into the raceway and contaminate your sewing environment. We've got to get rid of it. Same thing with the top. Now the top is more of an aesthetic thing. So I also focus some effort on that as well. There's our feed dog assembly. I had one person ask me when they looked at this picture, this particular picture I believe, is that a brand new feed dog assembly? Because it just looks so good. I said, nope, that's the same one restored. I think it may have been Emma. Emma may have asked me about that. Night and day, right? You're not going to get that anywhere else other than the workshop, folks. You're not. Now, I've talked about this before, this little, this little sill, this little edge where that plate is going to go over the top of the feed dogs is so essential that you restore that too because otherwise what will happen is the oil the dirt and everything you see on there will build up and build up and build up and build up and every time you take off that plate and you put that plate back on that plate is slowly and you're not going to notice it you'll notice it eventually because it'll impact your sewing and your material movement but that stuff actually starts to push that face that that plate up higher that goes over the feed dogs pushes it up a little bit higher higher and higher it might be thousands of an inch but it will retard the effectiveness of the feed dogs because as that plate comes up it's just like on the the slantomatics that have that throat plate razor that allows you to do free motion quilting by taking away the grip of the feed dogs if that plate isn't seated down as low as it needs to be by design, you're going to be losing the effectiveness of the pull of those feed dogs because that plate is going to be inhibiting how far those feed dogs can reach up to move that material. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, type in the chat, got it. I, I never thought of a, of a plate being that essential because it can literally retard the effectiveness of the feed dogs. If that was a learning lesson, would you be brave enough to step out and highlight that you learned something like that during this premiere? That's why I point things out like that. A lot of people just don't think about it. Look at the difference now. We know for sure that when I get done that that plate is going to be seated down all the way so we're going to get the full effectiveness of those feed dogs. How different does that look? That's the rear of the Pressurford bar and all that. This is on the rear of the... Uh, it's kind of right right off of the arm adjacent to the face plate and that was all junked up as well so here I'm starting to take all those layers off as well getting that restored back to the proper way it should be you see it's part of that bar assembly that controls the presser foot bar and that also was all coated in a combination of varnishing and rust this has been cleaned this has not. You can see the contrast immediately. You can see the contrast immediately. Step by step. It's a very time consuming process, but it's well worth it in the end. I've also kind of bounced around a little bit, done some cleaning on the back of the pillar. You can see part of the luster of the machine coming back again. Hitting that uh, paint again. Again, you go into a local sewing center, guess what? News flash! They're not going to do a thing with your paint finish on your machine. Whether it's a light industrial machine or a household machine, it's going to come back to you the same way. And once I get, taken, once I get done with repairs on a machine, parts replaced, deal with all the mechanics, the adjustments, and everything else, then I focus on mitigating all of the dirt 
inside and out on the machine, which is what I'm doing right now. And that's full circle. I know because I can see my gray hair on the side. <laughs> All right, last set of photos. And again, I want this to be part of the learning experience in our classroom. I want you to understand all these steps that I had to take the machine through, and I didn't even capture all of them to get the machine to this point. We wouldn't be at this point had I not gone through all those steps, and by us going through them together, it may give you ideas if you have a similar machine, a similar machine, what you can do to your machine to try to get it to the level that Jade's is now so that it can do that field of sew-offs that you saw it do during the course of this premiere and just knock them out of the park. So this is, um, I know that you like watching the machine sew and all that, but this is just as important in the learning process as seeing the machine operating. Operating is the finish line, the end of the race, and uh, all these things are what led up to us successfully running that race. And there's our good friend, the Singer Repairman. Just kind of relaxing a little bit. He came out and kind of wanted to see what I was working on, seeing the progress I was making. And also knowing that I had been working real hard was kind enough to bring me a piece of double bubble gum to give me a little bit of a break. You can't even see that in the shot, can you? There you go. Now you can see it. He brought me out a piece of bubble Double bubble gum. That's kind of a tongue twister, isn't it? Now I'm working down on the end near the uh, balance wheel. And look at the intensity of the grease build up there. One of the most essential parts of the machine where that power exchange is made from the motor supply of what we're using right now, which is a Husqvarna motor. Uh, Jade is going to be using a servo motor. But any of that stuff that's gummed into there and it's going to be holding back the free rotation of that balance wheel driving the main shaft, you don't get rid of it, you're not going to have a fully optimized machine. And whatever kind of motor you're using, it's not going to be performing as well as it could be. Plus it's going to cause the machine parts to break down more rapidly. <clears throat> Continue to plug down on the surface of the machine. Everything on the inside has been dealt with. All the adjustments have been made, parts have been replaced, the machine is happy. Now it needs to look good too and feel good about itself so it can sew better. It's the rear uh, cover on the back of the pillar for the machine. And you can see again another oiling point on the back of there as well. It's actually a little well that kind of runs down near the pitman arm that's kind of cool where you have to put oil in there as well. Does that look different? That's the after. That's the before. Yeah, looks a little different. You even recognize that machine anymore? From where we started, look at looking at that machine now, does it even look like the same machine? <laughs> well, it is, obviously. And you saw that on live on this live premiere today on uh, the video feed that it's, it's the same machine, it's just, it's gotten rid of all that baggage, all that junk from decades. Again, this machine is from 1935, right? So from 1935 to now, all the environmental things it's been exposed to and all the other things it's been exposed to just have really, really choked it. And now it can breathe free again. Kind of focusing on the plates now. Looks different, doesn't it? Looks very, very different. But see, I, this when you wick up all the junk that's into the clear coat and the paint, you, you pull it up, you pull it up, you pull it up, you pull it up, it keeps coming to the surface again, just like sludge. Till you get to a point where You've gotten it all wicked out of there, and eventually you can have a sustained uh, luster and shine like that.
Wow. Wow. That is what we want to be seeing. And I know that Jade will, as best as she can, maintain the good work that I put into her machine and could always bring the machine back and I can always service it again, maybe on an annual basis to keep it running at the top of its game. There's our faceplate. There's our faceplate again. Before. After. It becomes evident how filthy something is when you see the before and after, doesn't it? It is continuing to plug through the process. There's our upper tension assembly, disassembled, and every nook and cranny of that is going to be clean, conditioned. The parts that need to be oiled are oiled. The parts that need to be uh, clean and slick and free of any lubricant are going to be made that way. But you can just see all the junk and buildup on there. How in heaven's name can an upper tension work when it's in a condition like that? It can't. It just can't get its job done. We're setting it up to fail. It's like hiring somebody and telling them to, to, to do a job that they've never been trained for. They call it the sink or swim, right? That's not the way we work in the workshop. We don't say to a part, do your job and not give it every opportunity to, to succeed. We want to give it every opportunity to succeed so that when we reach this, this plateau of a premier, we might have a little hiccup and a bump here and there, but it's going to be, it's going to be success and victory. And that's what success and victory looks like in an upper tension right there. There it is reinstalled and it's ready to get the job done just as you saw it do today in this premiere. And there's the initial sew offs I did right there, some of which you saw today. Uh, and when you get to that stage, it's, it's just a sense of success and victory. Because it all comes down to that stitch, doesn't it? There, I'm just showing some uh, shots of my makeshift uh, powerhouse set up with the base of the Husqvarna. <laughs> and there's our stitch lines that were done, uh, well, kind of off camera, but done more as a mini clip for Facebook. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun when you get to that point? Well, and I can, let me go back just real quick. Doing the real long pieces like this one at the top of the screen, the blue one, which is protected full grain leather, uh, that's a lot of fun to do on a machine like this. You know, kind of buzz down and you just, but I've kind of learned my lesson. I can get away with doing that with protected full grain leather. If I try to do that again with genuine cowhide, I might do a pre-stitch set or something like that so that thing doesn't go south like it did for me today. I think that was our starting point. Yeah. So we've gone through all the pictures uh, to give you an idea of this, the process, at least a portion of the process, that I took Jade's uh, machine through. And I love the state of Tennessee, so I'm going to play as our last song, uh, Tennessee Hayride, Tennessee Hayride. All right, let's go back over to Jade's machine, and I'm just going to go through the uh, sew-offs again real quick that we just did during this premiere. There we go. Turn my light back on. Yeah, when I'm showing you stuff on Facebook, I, I, I've got to shut that light off, otherwise you're, you're looking at my reflection and you're not focusing on what's on the screen, right? I still have a little bit of varnishing on the bed, but it's, it's a lot cleaner than it was. It 
So, on this live premiere today, we sewed this horrendous bubblegum material. I've got to turn my screen around. We sewed this horrendous bubblegum material that really gave us a lot of a challenge in getting that stitch balance as far as tension. But eventually, I think we had uh, we had success in getting stitch lines that really looked quite good. If we sewed a ton of this stuff, we would find that sweet spot and we would have victory every single time with Jade's machine. We sewed this uh, protected full grain leather. I think it was protected. Double checking, double checking. Yeah, this was protected full grain. No, it wasn't. It was Italian. I'm sorry. Like I said, they look alike sometimes. We sewed this Italian leather, a real long run of it, and had some real good outcomes with uh, stitch uh, integrity, stitch presentation on the lock stitch and the top stitch. I think we could have given a little bit more to this side than we did to this side, but that's part of finding that sweet spot when you're working with a diverse field of materials and thicknesses. This is our protected full grain leather, some of which I sewed off camera, and then I also sewed a, a new strip of it where you can still see the tails, a new strip of it during this live premiere today, because I really wanted to show off this protected full grain leather uh, too, and do a long run with Jade's machine. We went super lightweight and sewed this material, which is cotton polyester blend with a little bit of stiffener, but the, the material itself is super paper thin on both sides. And Jade's machine, a light industrial machine, did a real bang up job in being able to sew super lightweight uh, as well. This one I kind of want to forget, but <laughs> This is my attempt to sew a real long strip of uh, genuine cowhide, which was a horrendous experience. But the end result is Jade's machine did a fabulous job of maintaining stitch integrity and stitch presentation in spite of my challenges in trying to manage this material with one hand as I was working the balance wheel and the foot, uh, the foot pedal, uh, foot control on the other side of the machine. So I did what I could do. Our elk hide, and uh, our elk hide, you remember we did three different stitch lines. On the one stitch line right here, where was it? The stitch line right here is when that thread wrapped around the, uh, the spool on top, and then I ended up having to uh, stitch another row again. Yeah, at any rate, it did a great job. Beautiful stitches, top stitch, and lock stitch as well. Again, through two layers of genuine elk hide. Look at that. Crazy. Commercial uh, vinyl. Excellent job, both sides. Commercial vinyl is just spot on. Commercial upholstery material. Six layers of this as well, like the vinyl. Fabulous job. And last but not least, my redemptive act of sewing genuine cowhide again and doing a pretty doggone good job of maintaining even stitches on the edges of that material. Yep, there's our sew-off sandwich right there on Jade's 1935, class 95-60. Yep, that's the finish line, folks. We're done, we're out of here. Thanks for attending this great premiere. Thank you to Jade and Lynn for sharing this great machine with me so I could bring it back to the top of its game. God bless you guys. Stay tuned for other premieres like this where you never know what kind of machine is going to be on the workbench. See ya. Oh, wait, wait, wait.